no central bank wants to engineer a recession. A lot of countries right now are playing catch up when it comes to getting inflation under control. I think the Fed's going to have to be aggressive. I do think recession risks are going up each time the Fed moves and the Fed moves very aggressively. At this point, I don't think a recession is yet inevitable. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keene. A Wednesday, an important Wednesday for the chairman of the Federal Reserve. He will need to address inflation like the inflation in the United Kingdom, 9.1%. Lisa, there is no other story. Especially because it's not just the headline inflation. It's also the input prices indicating you're going to see even further inflation. We have not seen peak inflation yet for the global economy, and that is concerning central bankers around the world. You can rationalize it all you want. That, no, not inflation that John Farrow's off for like a three-week sabbatical. Kaylee lines in for John Farrow today. And Kaylee, what they do, I love how they do this, Kaylee. They go headline inflation, and then they go, but Jerome Powell, I'm going to look at core inflation. Today, it's going to be Powell, core inflation, politicians, headline inflation. It's that simple. Well, and Powell talked about it in his press conference last week, Tom, that at the end of the day, what the consumer feels is headline inflation, is the higher prices at the pump, the higher prices at the grocery store. To, so to a certain extent, that is what the Fed is going to be responding to. And when you look at a day like today, where we're seeing commodity prices coming down because of <clears throat> demand concerns, growth concerns, yeah. does that make the Fed's job a little bit easier on that front? Because in theory, it brings that headline down if it lasts. Definitive research at Bloomberg this morning. Enda Curran in Hong Kong publishes World bubbliest housing markets. I mean, it's absolutely definitive, Lisa, isn't it? Well, especially because it's global in nature and there's sort of an existential underpinning, which I'm going to highlight go. just for uh, you, Tom, because you. you always like existential Wednesdays. This idea mm. of how many years can we have of low rate policies fueling mm. housing bubbles. When you get a reversal of that, how painful could it be? If you get financial markets and the baseline economy both deteriorating at the same time, does that mean a deeper recession? I don't know if I buy it, though, if you want to know the truth, Tom, because you're not seeing housing prices actually roll over that much. There isn't that much leverage baked into the system, but still, nonetheless, very much a concern as housing prices well, go down. And the current is going to join us from Hong Kong here on this. The United States right up there with New Zealand topping out and then the Czech Republic and then Hungary. A lot of other stuff to talk about here, Lisa. And I guess the basic idea, you know, you know, Matt Miller was talking recession angst. I don't know if I buy it. Is it angst or just we have no idea, just uncertainty? This is the moodiest summer ever. People are shifting their moods every day. The most this notable shift in mood, existential, moody. Children. Clearly, you and I both have teenagers. But uh, on, and we're looking right now at a scenario where bonds and stocks are no longer selling off in tandem. Bonds are yeah. rallying as stocks sell off. This is a traditional correlation. <clears throat> this is a more traditional uh, relationship having to do with uh, some sort of right. inflationary or recessionary environment. I find that interesting, Tom. Kaylee, what's interesting to me as well as commodities off the night here, Ed Moore at Citigroup, pretty lonely, saying at some point oil will pull back. Maybe we're on our way. 124 Brent is now breaching 110, 10947 Brent Kaylee. Yeah, and it's not just in oil. You're really seeing it across <clears throat> the commodities complex and metals as well. Dr. Copper not faring very well. Iron ore, which of course is really reflective around growth Recession concerns angst. in China in particular. You are seeing that growth and demand concern reflective in commodity prices. I would just note, Lisa was talking about the stock bond correlation. Obviously, the gains of yesterday are aren't holding. Yeah. Our producer Pete pointed out in the last 10 days, we've seen a gain of 1.4% or more on the S&P 500. Nine out of 10 of the next days were down, Tom. We just cannot hold on to a rebound in this market right now. Well, that leads to the data check, negative 58 on SPX, Dow negative 400. Uh, NASDAQ, I got to get the official surveillance mouse out, negative 1.5% on the NASDAQ 100. And the VIX from that 30 level and even 29 uh, advances out a little more angst, 31 point three three dollar resiliency yeah. that's where i want to go on a 104.47 dxy yen was solid 136 right now at that level 136 on yen a huge talking point right now with an international uh, economics euro 105.25 which means we need to stagger to a pre-powell briefing <laughs> thank you so much uh, tom today we are going to be hearing from fed chair jay powell speaking to a UN u.s senate panel that begins around Around 10 a.m., how does he address the fact that consumer sentiment is in the gutter? Explain this to radio. That's a killer chart. Well, we see the lowest <clears throat> consumer sentiment going back 
in history, decades, and this is for the University of Michigan Sentiment Survey, and some people argue this one doesn't accurately reflect the core inflation that the Fed wants to look at because it encounters uh, some of the issues with gasoline prices. Nonetheless, it is clearly factoring into the Fed's decisions, especially given the fact that people are expecting a stickier inflation over a longer period of time. Today, we also hear from Fed officials, including Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin, Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans, and Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker. You should be so happy, Tom, that we have all of the Fed speakers back and getting back up mm -hmm. and, and giving some insight into what to expect. I'm watching the dollar. You know, Tom, you mentioned the dollar, the strength, and that this is the haven. At what point does this become a liability for a Federal Reserve that does have an eye toward international stability? This is going to be disruptive as the rest of the world grapples with some of the same issues as the United States, particularly with inflation, given the fact that they will have to be importing more inflation from the United States if the dollar continues to strengthen. And today, <laughs> President Biden is expected to speak on his proposal to suspend federal gas taxes, probably going to come around 2 p.m., how much does this really bring the price of gas down, right? I mean, it's 18 cents or something like that. A lot of people have come out pretty much against this, saying it will only increase demand and counter uh, the, the decline in price that you see. Tom, very controversial. How much support yeah. does he even get from his own Democratic Party? And it leads as well to the tax differential that we see, folks, between Europe nation to nation, and also what we see in the United States, state to state uh, as well. William Dudley will join us in the 7 o'clock hour, the former president of the New York uh, Fed. His essays for Bloomberg Opinion have been a clinic. They hearken back to his magnificent work at Goldman Sachs years ago. And he's released one this morning, and we begin this morning with Dara Mayer, and yes, we will talk to the Yen uh, with Dara. But Darrow, Bill Dudley, and who's going to be on later, says economic history in a hard landing. He is essentially predicting a hard landing. What does the dollar do if there is a Dudley hard landing? It rallies. I mean, it, it, it's, you talk of history. History is pretty clear on this point. Um, if the U.S. economy declines a lot. So, you know, as you say, a hard landing rather than some nicely navigated Goldilocks outcome. Then the dollar rallies. And of course, if that's happening while the rest of the world is also slowing, then that only adds to that kind of dollar bid. So, uh, yeah, I think on that one, history is pretty straightforward. Are there any other havens, Adara, especially at a time when we're watching the yen fall out of bed? Are there any other currencies that also will get a bid? Look, I, th I still think there is um, hope for the yen, if you like, on that front. What, what it's combating at the moment is rising U.S. yields. Uh, you know, historically, when we're in a risk-off mode, it's been associated with lower uh, U.S. yields, typically, you know, the bid for treasuries. Um, again, looking to history, in periods where U.S. yields are rising, that supersedes any yen safe haven kind of allure. But if we're in an environment now where markets are thinking, well, you know, we, we have peak Fed rate expectations. We're now going to get more worried about a U.S. recession and a global recession. Um, then I would say the yen is kind of mispriced for that in, in terms of recession risk. OK, so you were saying the BOJ might not actually reach the point where it has to give in, Dara? Well, it certainly doesn't feel imminent. Um, you know, again, we had we had minutes from the BOJ recently, and it shows that some members wanted it to be more explicit uh, that monetary policy is not about targeting the exchange rate. Of course, it's, it's the government, it's the Ministry of Finance in Japan uh, that is much more exercised about this. And it's also uh, they who hold the trigger on currency intervention. So from a BOJ perspective, in isolation, it's inflation and inflation expectations are still low, 0.8%. Um, so it's hard for them to offer a rationale for uh, why they right. should begin any even steps or talk of, of a, a tightening phase. There are very importantly here, and this goes to the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation and what you people did across the Pacific Rim for pushing on 200 years. All of a sudden, or I should say suddenly, on a log chart, Thai bot gives way. Philippine peso and grand, there's a distraction of the election in the Philippines, gives way. Is EM in this heated June giving way to a new velocity, a new weakness? Uh, no, well, look, I, I think volatility is, is part of the, the, the global deal at the moment. And emerging market currencies generally struggle when you've got slowing global growth. They struggle when you've got a stronger dollar and a, and a Fed that's tightening. So a lot of the ingredients are there, if you like, on a macro scale 
uh, to pressure EM lower. But the currencies you mentioned, Thai baht, Philippine pesos, you know, these are currencies at HSBC that we've been much more cautious on than some others. There are uh, there are some potential outliers on the positive side in emerging markets as well. Brazil has been one that we like, despite its, its, its recent weakness, for example. So I think you've got to pick your battles really in EM. It, it, I don't think there's a kind of a, a one, one size fits all there, but look, mm-hmm. the macro back, backdrop is challenging clearly, Tom. Dara, thank you so much. Just a great brief to get us uh, started today. I want to brief on the William Dudley column right now. Lisa, you've taken a look at it as well. He's been heated. He was phenomenal on our Fed show uh, with, with a really terse ter- statement of where the terminal rate is and this morning is no exception. I mean, the line here says everything in the lead. A recession is inevitable within the next 12 to 18 months. This, according to the former New York yeah. Fed president, saying falling back down to earth will not be a pleasant experience. There is no historical precedent for the Federal Reserve to bring down inflation this much, this quickly, without causing a recession. Right. It just seems like it is the inevitability that we are facing over the next uh, year or so. And I want to make clear, this is the Berkeley PhD who did market economics in some would say invented modern Goldman Sachs market economics, where it's about paragraph by paragraph. Hatzius has carried this forward. And Lisa, this note reads like a Goldman Sachs note from 30 years ago, paragraph by paragraph. And it's a direct response to Ed Yardeni yesterday in response to your question yes. about there is yeah, no Volcker on the That's Fed. Fair. Well, perhaps there is something a little more <clears throat> Volcker-esque than some people have been expecting yeah. with a Fed very much committed to bringing inflation the back battle, down to 2%. The toxic brew of the this recession. It's your Denny. It's your Denny against Dudley. <laughs> really? Team Economist Wrestling. Stay with us. Great Future's day. negative 52. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Good morning. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden wants Congress to do something about soaring gasoline prices. Bloomberg's learned he'll call on lawmakers today to enact a gasoline tax holiday. Average gas prices in the U.S. are around $5 a gallon. Federal taxes make up a little more than 18 cents of that. It's not clear how long the president wants to pause the tax. In the UK, inflation has risen to a new four-decade high. Prices rose 9.1% in May from a year ago. There were broad increases in the cost of everything from fuel and electricity to food and beverages. There were also more signs of inflationary pressures building at the wholesale level. Raw material costs increased the most on record. China is vowing more pro-growth policies to boost the country's COVID-battered economy. The government will speed up fiscal spending as well as the sale of special local government bonds. Plus, a newspaper affiliated with the cabinet is urging banks to increase lending for infrastructure projects. The Senate has voted to advance a bipartisan gun safety bill and final passage is expected later this week. Backers call the measure the biggest breakthrough on the issue in decades. It's designed to improve background checks, securing schools and giving states federal funds to combat gun violence. And Bitcoin has resumed its fall. The largest cryptocurrency sank to just above that key $20,000 threshold. For months, cryptos have been moving in the same direction as stocks. And today's moves were no exception. Investor appetite for risk assets has been falling in the midst of fears about a recession. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. We do need more money. But we don't just need more money for vaccines for children eventually. We need more money to plan for the second pandemic. There's going to be another pandemic. We have to think ahead. And that's not something the last outfit did very well. That's something we've been doing fairly well. That's why we need the money. The president of the United States on one of the myriad tasks he has in June here. A lot of people saying he's overwhelmed with any number of topics. 
but all of them pushed aside by possibly this afternoon, 2 p.m. ish. There will be a reduction in the gas tax in New York, Montana, and I believe in New Mexico as well. Amory Horton has visited all those states and joins us right now. Futures <laughs> negative 52. Brent crude off, you know, the oil coming down here, 124 down to 109 as well. I've never seen this, Amory. I guess I can summarize through the good Greg Vallier at AGF. The reviews are scathing. This once again is about the operational process of Mr. Biden's White House. It seems to be chaos. What does he do today? Well, today he's going to ask Congress to have a gas tax holiday, get rid of the 18 cents that you pay federal tax on a gallon of gasoline, because obviously this is something the administration is really feeling the pain from. This is showing up in the polls, and this is ahead of the midterm elections. The issue is Congress is not going to act. You don't need to be a betting human to think that Congress is going to move on this. For months, they've been talking about this, and Democratic okay. leaders, not okay, just the Amory, Republicans, I, have been throwing cold water on it. It's Interrupt Wednesday. Excuse me here. I, I want to cut to the chase. I'm, I'm less <laughs> interested in the gas tax and I'm more interested in the process in the White House. I can't see this in eight of the last 10 administrations. How does this stuff get vetted if not only Greg Vallier, but many, many others say dead on arrival? Well, I think with the prior administration, there was also a lot of concerns and questions about how those processes moved through the Oval Office. What I think recent reporting Bloomberg had from Saleh Mosin really shows that there is a small huddle, especially when it comes to economic issues. The first nine months of the president's administration, we learned that Secretary Yellen was not invited in by Ron Klain to some of these huddles. So it does seem like there is a small group of individuals, most notably Ron Klain, of course, Brian Deese, and the president talking about these issues. Well, the issue you have with today is that this is very much so performative. This is, this is the administration trying to spin inflation. We are trying to do something because we know this is hurting consumers at the pump, but it's going to go nowhere. There's no substance. Well, but Anne-Marie, it's performative and it's failing even at the performative aspect. I mean, it's not gotten as the support as Greg Valliere uh, highlighted, but it's also Jason Furman, formerly of the Clinton administration and the economics team there. People coming out with scathing reviews wholesale. What is this performative uh, exercise for? Who is it for and who is it going to be successful towards? And if it's not going to be successful for Lisa, anyone. How come Lisa in asks clearer Wednesday, questions than I do? Then, then at about? what point does this really highlight the desperation, Anne-Marie, in this administration? Well, listen, we don't know yet exactly how the public, right, the everyday consumer is going to think of this. If you see a headline, Biden is acting on calling on Congress to get rid of a tax, and you're not looking into some of the details of that, potentially that is a Democratic voter that <clears throat> says, I like what the president's doing. He is trying. Again, they are trying to be seen as doing something right now, right, because there's not a whole lot they can do in this market to bring down gasoline prices. Yeah. So, so that's first. It's it's really just going to be about making a speech, calling on Congress, hoping those headlines get out because it is actually not going to happen. Well, as you say, Anne-Marie, the administration is running out of cards to play, and yet they are continuing to try to coax energy players to pump more oil to try and solve the problem uh, with constrained supply. They're meeting, uh, Secretary Granholm is meeting with oil executives tomorrow, and yet Biden is publicly sparring in some sense with the CEO of Chevron. I mean, can you square these things for us? <clears throat> Yeah, that was uh, quite a moment yesterday, and that was from our Jennifer Jacobs asking the president for his reaction from Mike Worth's Chevron letter. And Mike Worth was saying there needs to be a different approach from this administration. And we have done the work, the oil industry, and he says that this administration, Mike Worth's words, is vilifying and criticizing them too much. And the president shot back and said he's mildly sensitive. I didn't think uh, the oil executives couldn't handle this. And then he again called for more refining capacity. But right. anyone that knows anything about the energy industry right now, we haven't had refining capacity or money, capital, investment in refining capacity before the pandemic. This same CEO told Alex Steele a few months ago mm -hmm. that he doesn't think another 
refine or whatever be built in the United States. So, so this is an interesting moment for the president because he is trying to get Houston on board, right? He is trying to get the Permian to pump more at the same time, publicly calling them out. I think tomorrow's meeting is going to be incredibly interesting with Secretary Granholm. And marie is there anyone in the administration who is saying that the approach to Russia and banning oil from that nation hasn't worked exactly to plan? Well, there's something they're still discussing with it, which is this cap on oil prices. So Russian oil could make it into the market, but Russia is not reaping the benefits of the prices we are seeing. This is something that the president's energy secretary, Amos Hochstein, said to us very early on when Russia invaded <clears throat> Ukraine. It was also the fact that not just that you're taking Russia product from the West, but mm -hmm. that Putin can still sell that same oil to China and to India and get a premium. What did Russia make last month, according to the IEA? $20 billion selling their fossil fuels. Amory Horton, thank you so much. And again, I will visit, I believe, later on in surveillance uh, this morning. Lisa, we've got to take time on the various strikes and rumblings of strikes in the United Kingdom. You wonder, you know, the largest train strike in 30 years, I believe, as well. Really complete chaos over there. Airlines as well. Royal Mail talking about going out on strike. And, and Lisa, you just wonder, does that come across the Atlantic over into a more fractious labor uh, environment in the United States? Especially as you have a Federal Reserve and policymakers saying that it is an inevitability that uh, the unemployment rate is going to go up and you have consumers, the employees, dealing with higher inflation and needing higher wages to just keep pace with where prices are. There was an article highlighting how a lot of companies that are advertising job openings are simply removing those job mm. openings. It's not necessarily job cuts, but Tom, after not being able to fill those roles, they just let them go. And I think this is the stealth tightening of a labor market that has been ultra loose until now. And you, you wonder here on the CPI, I'm looking up, Farrow does this better than me. I mean, there's no question about that. I'm looking here, Kaylee, at CPI. I got PCE deflator. I got June 30th. Some GDP noise. July 13th is the next CPI report, of course, below the, before the July 27 report. That's going to be important, Kaylee. 8.6% is a survey number. Yeah, and what if it comes in hot, Tom? Does that be yeah. the deciding factor between 50 and 75 mm. basis points at that July meeting yeah. for the Federal Reserve? And, of course, that's not the only data we're going to be getting between now and then. Sentiment and inflation expectations will also be coming through. We know that mm -hmm. Powell & Co. is paying attention to that. That's a long ways away. 8.6% headline. 6% core CPI. Maybe the Yankees will lose a game or two before then. This is <laughs> Bloomberg. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you for being with us. So we'll have complete coverage of Jerome Powell. What time is that, Lisa? I have no clue. Well, the prepared comments get released at 9.30 a.m., okay. and then at 10 a.m., the testimony begins. Aren't you really sorry you asked? I'm, I'm really glad somebody's up to speed on this. But these are important comments, and, of course, we'll address the emotions out there. I would suggest, Lisa, we touched on this yesterday. Yesterday was sort of a nudgy day. Today there's a little more clarity here. Future's negative 51. But, Lisa, yesterday we touched on this, the emotion over a longer weekend of the impact of inflation on everybody. It's tangible. It's tangible. And then people start to ask, has it been priced in? And yesterday there was actually a sigh of relief in markets. Nudgy to the upside. And today yeah. it's not nudgy. It's just to the downside as people start to price in what Bill Dudley called the inevitable of recession in the next right. year to 18 months. Here is the important conversation of the day with lots of years of experience. Margie Patel uh, at Pioneer for years and now All Spring Global Investments is definitive on high yield and has been brilliant on shifting to equities amid the carnage. Margie, you and I have never seen a bear market in bonds like this. The Bloomberg total return of high yield series is down 13 percent. I'm going to call it three years of coupon. I'll let you correct me on that. What do you do? Forget about the genius of Margie Patel and equities. What do you do if you're in bonds to recover or the emotion of trying to catch up clipping coupons? 
I think all you do at this point, because of the huge correction we've had in bonds, high yield and investment grade and treasuries is just weighted out. Uh, at least you're getting the coupon income, and we have the promise down the road because virtually the whole bond universe is now trading at a discount. We could have that little capital appreciation back to par if the Fed ever decides to reverse uh, their uh, very perilous course they're taking here. Okay, so this is really important. You're on the edge of Daniel Fuss over at Loomis Sales here. You're looking right now as bonds is a clip the coupon and you're going to get a gain out there at some point. Well, that's right, especially in high yield, because there you've had a huge correction, really not because of credit spreads getting wider, people worried about bankruptcies, but just following treasuries. So bond prices have gone from, say, 103 for the average high yield bond to about 87 cents on the dollar. So that makes a lot more return, say, 7 to 9 percent for decent companies with positive earnings. That's not a bad rate of return. Margie, have stocks actually acted as the hedge you thought they would? Uh, well, no, I expected stocks would go down, and of course we see the weaker links, the most vulnerable, have gone down the most. And uh, the thing is, even if you don't own those weak links, the SPACs, the uh, negative cash flow, small companies that were able to come to the market, that still can roll over to the other market and affect everybody's uh, risk budget pretty much. And I think that's what we're seeing is that just roll through to other sectors, people being fearful about uh, what's going to happen to the economy besides the areas that are weak. Well, Margie, to that point, we just had summer begin. This is sort of a reset moment where people take a look at the 20-plus plunge in the S&P and the massive uh, disruption in bond markets. And PIMCO's view is, wait a second, bonds suddenly hold value in a way that they hadn't in decades and take a look at how much value they hold versus stocks. Are you kind of starting to lean toward that type of assessment? Well, I think in high yield, when you look at, as I said, a yield of 7, 8, 9 percent with uh, 10 or 12 percent discount from face value, uh, if you think equities might do, say, mid-single digit to low double digit over the next, say, 12 to 18 months, that makes high yield bonds look pretty competitive, assuming we don't have a big jump in defaults, which are about 1 percent now. It doesn't look like we will, but uh, we haven't seen the Fed uh, complete their, their um Fed tightening, so it's not really clear how much this will go over into the real economy well, but, and hurt financial results. But, but Margie, because it's Interrupt Wednesday or whatever Tom called it, just to follow on to that, do you not see value in higher rated bonds? I mean, is this still a moment where stocks offer a better hedge even after all the losses? And I don't want to say contagion, but the influence from the SPACs and other over leveraged areas of equities? Uh, well, I think so because the yield is simply a lot higher, the, the gross yield, and also uh, because the yield is, say, four, five, six hundred basis points more than treasuries, they aren't as sensitive. Investment-grade bonds are very sensitive to treasuries. They trade at a pretty small yield premium. So it's really more a bet on what treasury yields are going to do, whereas high yield, you're getting something that looks pretty much like a, an equity-like return, mm -hmm. uh, if only from the coupon income. So that looks like a pretty good deal if you're uh, a little bit nervous and you don't want to wait out what we may see further bottoming in the equity markets. Okay, well, Margie, you mentioned what treasury yields are going to do. There has been been a relationship for some time now where when you see yields go up, it puts pressure on equities because especially those of higher multiples uh, that command higher multiples. Now we're seeing yields coming in, but the reason why is growth concerns. So can that be a supportive factor for the equity market? Or if the concern is around recession, that just means more downside for equities? Well, I think so far in this equity correction, what we've seen mostly is a erosion in the price earnings ratio from call it say 21 times earnings to maybe about say 16 times earnings going forward, rather than uh, people saying, oh, earnings are going low. So what I think I'm looking for as we start to see the quarter results, which will be in a few weeks, is are companies beginning to talk about lower earnings, which could cause not only that PE compression, but you may see stocks go down just on earnings expectation. But clearly, you have a much bigger cushion um, with the PEs having gone down so much in the, uh, the better parts of the market. Well, to that point, I'm looking at the NASDAQ 100 for an example, which traded at a multiple of about 30 at the end of last year, now trading down around 20 times. Where has enough value been created or valuations come in enough that you actually think it is safe to find an entry point here? 
I think this is a pretty attractive level because uh, the average stock is down 15, 20, maybe 30 percent in NASDAQ. The price earnings ratios are more reasonable, more average, looking over a longer time period. And the question really is what companies will be able to maintain their earnings and uh, not have sharp earnings declines from here. Uh, but still, I think with so much uh, speculative money that's right. really gotten hurt so <clears throat> far this year, that can roll over into the better quality names, too. Margie, a rude question. Is 60-40 dead, 60% equities, 40% bonds? You fought against that your whole life. Is it finally dead? I think it is because I think what we've had since the financial crisis a decade ago and now is the Fed's discovered that they can control interest rates and they seem to like to do that. And I don't think they're ever going to want to let interest rates float where the market would like to see. So I think that says interest rates will be lower regardless of inflation than anything we've seen yeah. um, in the past X decades. Margie Patel, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. All Spring Global Investments. There's lots going on here. The VIX ought to stick 31.23. And of course, we're watching yen here. Uh, I got to get it on my screen. 136.19, pretty much unched on yen, but not unched. Is Mr. Save? He's at Deutsche Bank. One of our interns, uh, Lisa here, uh, sends in a note. Hey, stupid! You've got to pay attention to what Savings <laughs> saying at Deutsche Bank. I'm oh, Lisa. Uh, what, Aww, what is saving so saying at Deutsche Bank? <laughs> Man, you know how to flatter me on a Wednesday, yeah. interrupt Wednesday. I'm looking at his comments about the likelihood of recession. He says it's about a 50% likelihood that we get a global recession. He also talks about how uh, the inflation that we're seeing is a threat to democracy. They see this as permanent inflation that needs to be countered more dramatically. Mm. Uh, however, he does, is confident that there is going to be yeah. some sort of method to combat this. What I find also interesting is he talks about about a banking union in Europe and mergers and the idea of consolidation right. in order to weather this storm. We're looking at a new uh, landscape where you've got a growing number of executives and policymakers saying that there is a greater than 50 percent chance of a global recession. And Tom, that is what you're feeling in the tape today. And that is right. what you're feeling people game out. For our American audience, and I, I met with him informally in Davos, I've never formally interviewed Mr. Saving, but um, Lisa, the only equivalent I can think of in American banking is Brian Moynihan. He's, he's completely steeped in the consumer and retail experience. And this headline, this is not at all temporary inflation, is the theme of the next 90 days. Is it? Well, Christian Saving has an extra leg up also on Brian Moynihan in that he took Deutsche Bank from what was left for dead for some people, expecting it to be assumed by another uh, banking entity in the European Union, and actually made it viable in a way that people hadn't <clears throat> imagined for a long time. He was sort of heralded as bringing this sort of new dawn to the bank, whether that's in question now, is uh, left up in the air given some of the uh, existential threats to just the entire economy. However, Looking at how these uh, main executives are gaming out recession in the U.S. and yeah. Europe by the second half of 2023, mm. Tom, that's a game changer and is the reason why yesterday we were talking about the new, uh, the new discussion is how deep the recession will be. Will it be shallow? Will it be right. steeper? And how do we climb out? I mean, Kaylee, it's real simple here. There's a headline buried in like 40 headlines on the Bloomberg. Uh, Mr. Saving taking second look at ESG after greenwash allegations. You follow this tangentially, Kaylee, off the dynamic show Crypto. Folks, if you missed that yesterday, you can see it on 47 digital uh, platforms. But Kaylee, I mean, how dead is ESG right now? I think that's the question. The, the problem with ESG has always been, Tom, how, how unclear the parameters of it are and the concept of greenwashing, saying things are green when really they aren't or you're just Is that using what that means? I don't even offsets. know. What does greenwash mean? I don't know. It's the idea that you aren't actually making as much of a difference as, as you say that you are. And for sustainable investing, until you get more firm metrics, it becomes, it's very muddy. And of course, this is a particular problem at DWS. We saw those raids uh, several weeks ago, which is what saving is alluding to here. But I I would note that it's not just about the E in SG. It's not just about green investing, for example. It is also social and government governance. And remember when we saw Tesla kicked out of the S&P ESG index, Tom, even though it's an EV company? The issue there was not with the green. It was with social and governance. And Elon Musk, we know, took a bit of an issue with that. We thank Mr. Musk for his conversation with John Mickletwite yesterday at the Cutter Economic Forum. Futures are negative 55, down futures at negative 382. The VIX, 31.26. Little 
It's a toxic brew of angst this morning. <laughs> this is Thanks, Bloomberg. Al. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Bloomberg's learned that President Biden will call on Congress to enact a gasoline tax holiday. The president's expected to make a statement today. Average gasoline prices are around $5 a gallon in the U.S. and they typically rise in the summer. Federal taxes are 18.4 cents a gallon. It's not clear how long the president wants the tax to be paused. Boeing CEO sees supply chain issues lasting until the end of next year. David Kuhn also told Bloomberg Sky Johnson that's not the industry's only problem. We have a very large, sophisticated and somewhat fragile supply chain behind the airplane manufacturers. And just as fragile, it turns out, are the operators themselves, the airlines, and the ability to staff up with pilots, the ability to staff up the ground crews, maintenance crews, etc. He was interviewed at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin is calling on the central bank to raise interest rates as fast as it can, as long as it doesn't cause undue harm to markets or the economy. In Barkin's words, go as fast as you can without breaking anything. Fed policymakers raised their benchmark rate by 75 basis points earlier this month. That was the biggest increase since 1994. In Afghanistan, at least 920 people have been killed and hundreds more injured in a powerful earthquake. The magnitude 6.1 quake struck the southeastern part of the country overnight. The government has sent helicopters and rescue teams. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We are seeing signs that tighter financial conditions are likely weighing on economic activity already. Um, we think that these signs are likely to intensify. Yeah. We're getting the sense that uh, housing is beginning to feel the pinch of tighter financial conditions. Bush Shriyam of Barclays yesterday, piercing on the housing economy. We do this with a median price in the United States, ticking over $400,000. It's like Dow 10,000. Don't tell John Farrell, but I can equate it to Dow 10,000. Just 400,000 is just a huge emotional number for those tracking housing. In the last 20 years in the United States, the median price was up in the last 10 years back, 1992-ish, I think, up 4% per year and in the previous in the nearest 10 years rather it's up 8% uh, per year so there's been a real adjustment there from a 4% per year gain to an 8% year uh, gain and the current in Hong Kong and Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics has done a global study of your biggest headache, which is rent and housing prices. And it is absolutely definitive. And I know Lisa wants to jump in here. But let me ask one question. How bad is it? It's pretty worrying, Tom, because what we're seeing now is potentially a reversal of those huge gains that we saw during the pandemic when a lot of new buyers came into the market on very low borrowing costs. As you know, interest rates were so low. That's now being unwound due to inflation. Central banks bringing up their interest rates. That's bound to hurt households paying back those mortgages now. To be clear, we're not yet at 2008-style territory, but it certainly is a significant potential headwind for an already slowing global economy. And uh, I think it's an important characterization. This is not necessarily going to be uh, the bottom falling out from underneath the housing market, as you say, because there isn't the same type of leverage. There isn't the same sort of shadow banking system fueling the growth of houses purely for the flipping of them. At the same time, can you give us a sense of why it is so much more painful in an economic downturn when the housing market does not cooperate and cannot necessarily be fueled by the same type of monetary policy that's already been used. Yep, you're absolutely right, Lisa. As you mentioned, there are buffers. Banks are in better condition. Household savings are in good order. And of course, labor markets around the world are strong. Nonetheless, if we do have, when we are in fact in the middle of a synchronized monetary policy tightening cycle, the likes of which we haven't seen for some decades, that means there's going to be an inevitable impact on mortgage costs and on the prices of houses. That will flow through to consumers by denting their household wealth. 
It will hurt consumer confidence. It will flow through to activity around construction and sales. And, of course, as we know, real estate and residential houses are big multipliers in any economy. They're at the core of economic activity. And if we see a slowdown in house prices and housing activity, even without a crash, per se, like you're saying, that's going to come on top of everything else that's going on, which is a pretty, sub- a pretty subdued consumer due to inflation, the energy and food crisis, the ongoing supply chain problems. So I think it's probably the last thing that the global policy mix- maker set needs right now is a housing crisis on top of everything else. But in theory, Enda, couldn't this also be helpful in that once it feeds through to sentiment and it starts to lead to more demand destruction, it actually helps with the inflation problem? Well, exactly right. Again, this is a textbook, okay? The idea is central banks do, of course, want activity to slow down. And when you have slower activity, the thinking is that will, it will slow down inflation. Uh, you heard the, the, the Fed official speaking earlier about how he wants the Fed to go fast without breaking things. And that's the whole crux of this. Uh, plenty of first-time home buyers around the world would welcome a cooling of house prices, but can central banks pull that off? Can they cool house prices and cool inflation without sending their economies and broader markets into a slump? And Bloomberg Economics have done the hard numbers on this, and they're pointing to some economies that are vulnerable, and that they include the U.S. and the likes of Canada and New Zealand in there as well. Some central banks are already warning that they do see potential for a material correction in their house prices as interest rates go up. So it's going to be something of a pretty tricky balancing act to to have house prices coming off at a nice stable pace without, of course, hurting the whole broader uh, uh, consumer and recovery story. Well, you mentioned some of the specific countries, New Zealand, Canada, the UK is in there as well as the Czech Republic and Hungary. Which is the most vulnerable to... um, to look, looks the most vulnerable to something more systemic emanating from housing? Well, on the Bloomberg economic rankings, uh, uh, probably New Zealand, that's a standout. But each country has their own vulnerability. They have their own pockets of vulnerability in different areas. And, of course, a lot will depend on how aggressive this interest rate hiking cycle ultimately proves to be. If we reach a point in the not-too-distant future whereby it's clear inflation has peaked and, in fact, the economic damage is, is to the point that central banks sort of... Uh, ease up on the rate hiking, well, then obviously that will take pressure off the housing market. But if we go into the end of the year with rate hikes going at the pace that they are now, that's going to have, the expectation is that will have a material impact because, remember, there's a lag effect in monetary policy. It takes takes some months before it really does hit consumers' pockets. And uh, what did Finland get right? Well, I I guess uh, we're going to find out if they are getting things right or not, Tom. I mean, we're early stages in this cycle at the moment. I think that's what a lot of people are saying. We have to give this time. I think six months from now, one year from now, it will be clear that when the tide goes out, just which housing markets and which banking sectors right. are in good order. And, that, and that's the feedback I've gotten from a lot of people today, is that we're still early in all of this. And to thank you so much. Early with research from Bloomberg Economics, so it's absolutely definitive on global housing. It's You know, Lisa, to me, it's almost like Jonathan uh, Miller and Miller Samuel taking Manhattan and distilling, or New York City, and distilling out five boroughs. Enda and his team do the same thing, but across many nations. I want to dive into one point that he mentioned, Please. and Kaylee was mentioning this as well that eventually this will bring down inflation because eventually lower housing prices will translate into lower rents and that will uh, be a big decompression for some of the inflation. The concern is right now that there is so little housing versus the demand that even if you get housing price declines, rents are still climbing at a record pace, unprecedented pace. Uh, In some areas, 40% year over year, I'm thinking of Miami, for example, uh, if you take a look at some of the rents in April, given the fact that there is not the supply and given the fact that people who are would have otherwise been buyers can no longer do so at a mortgage rate of six percent rents are only poised to climb further in the next six months this is a huge concern to so many economists seeing pressure on the cpi even with housing prices getting a little cooler you know we talk in our real bloomberg world about idiosyncratic like turkish lira maybe is idiosyncratic but kaylee i would suggest region to region almost city and village in america This is highly idiosyncratic. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, you talk about the five boroughs here in New York, Tom. I'm a resident of a new borough, Brooklyn, because it has gotten so expensive in Manhattan. And frankly, Brooklyn isn't much cheaper. Matt Miller, our colleague, recently bought a house in Westchester. And Tom, he was like, you should move up there. Get a yard for the dog. Come join me uh, a little north of the city. I can't afford that mortgage. It is, and it speaks to the catch-22 people are facing when you have higher mortgage rates, which limits your ability to buy a home. 
and rents are also high. Well, speaks to the problem. Yeah, I, I think the mortgage rate, I haven't looked this morning, like Julia Coronado, Lisa, talking up 6%, boom, yeah. we're there, there in a is. matter of days. It's actually exceeding 6%. So <clears throat> this is a reason why yeah. people are not able to get the same kinds of mortgages. They're not getting approved. And then they decide oh, not to buy or they lower the price and then they rent. We will follow this on Bloomberg Surveillance, folks. We understand, you know, it's not the market. It's not the yen. It's not bond dynamics. And, oh, I don't care about them. Lisa and Farrell care about them. I don't, you know. The 10 year yields 3.22%. There, that's my bond coverage. You're right there, Kelly. That's my bond coverage for the day. <laughs> Which hotels, Farrow and in Capri? It's, it's Le, Le Corbusier. That's, that's one word for it. This is Bloomberg. No central bank wants to engineer a recession. A lot of countries right now are playing catch up when it comes to getting inflation under control. I think the Fed's going to have to be aggressive. I do think recession risks are going up each time the Fed moves, and the Fed moves very aggressively. At this point, I don't think a recession is yet inevitable. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Ramitz, and Tom Keene, thank you for being with us. We're back on track in this hour. Lots of distractions in the last hour. It's about inflation. It's about recession. Lisa, William Dudley says it's about a hard landing. In the next 12 to 18 months, and the specificity is what really struck me about the column that was published this morning, talking about how it is now inevitable that we are going to get a recession in such a short time frame, building on what other people have been saying, that there's a growing chance of some sort of downturn. Turn. Now the question is, Tom, how steep it will be and whether it's accurately priced into markets. And this is the gauging of the many different types of recession. If you lived them, folks, we don't need a history lesson here, but each one of them is different. And Lisa, you were correct to mention this distinction between two world-class PhDs, Yardeni, gentle recession, Dudley, a hard landing. Powell's not going to mention the hard landing today. Well, and he might not mention Volcker either. In other words, whether he will be the new Volcker well of yes, 2022. Yes, yes. And that is really the distinction here. How much is the Fed committed, yes, to getting to inflation back down to 2%, but imminently, right, by the end of next year versus, say, in five to 10 years out? How much do they see this urgency of getting inflation expectations in check, especially after that UMISH survey showed that they were creeping higher over the next decade or so. Hey, what's interesting here, Kaylee, is dollar resiliency, but in the bond market, I mean, I don't need to do a bond bond data check because nothing's moved. I mean, there's a there's a three-day stasis here in fixed income. Well, you are seeing yields coming in a little bit this morning, Tom, the 10 year yield is down about seven basis points now as we speak. And it is that kind of fle fleeing to safe havens due to some of the growth fears out there. And I, I would so. note, too, that while you are seeing that present in the dollar, the lone Asian currency stronger against the dollar today was the Japanese yen, which, as we've been talking about well, for weeks now, has been so weak, yet it <clears> is getting a little bit see, of that haven bid back in. I should not even come in, folks, in the morning. Kaylee Lines is so far out in front of me. <laughs> Lisa, you know, you mentioned safe haven. And the first thing you look at is Euro Swissy, and Lines is, of course, 100% correct. I've got Euro Swissy in after the Swiss bank, 1.02 on Euro, Euro Swissy, stronger Swiss franc. Well, and this is also because the euro uh, has been not supported by an ECB that has let inflation get far ahead right. of monetary policy that's still super easy. At what point <clears throat> do the central banks try? for our, our stronger currency. Remember, it was a race to the bottom. We've talked about this for months, but I do think this is going to be the theme for 2022, the race to a stronger yeah. currency. One final question, Lisa. You know, we talk about a lot of Fed speak, and you've got in the brief this morning, and, and that, what does Powell not want to say today? I find that always the most interesting. He doesn't want to use the word recession, right, that we're going to cause recession. He doesn't want to say that they're willing to cause recession in order to uh, get inflation under control, although that's what he's basically yeah. intimated. And what he doesn't really want to say is that he sees a Larry Summers outlook for 5% unemployment yeah, for the next five I, I years. I can see that. And that that's going to be what it takes to bring inflation back to that 2% level. There'll be a distinguished Republican senator and Chairman Powell will go, Larry who? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we'll Sorry, see that familiar. as well. Futures at negative 49, Dow futures negative 333. The VIX on a stick, 30. 
into a 29 briefly, and we come back 31.19. Briefly on bonds, 3.21% in the 10-year. Two-year yield out of that panic of 3.42, 3.11. Now, you know, I'm only giving a bond data check, folks, because John from Punta Tregara, wherever that is in Capri, John says do more fixed income. (laughs) Uh, The curve, 10 uh, basis points. The real yield, a negative 0.59%. Briefly, a brief. Lisa? (laughs) I will just say bonds actually have been fascinating in their stasis uh, because they've reached Lisa, a certain Lisa, kind if the of bond place. market was closed for five days, you would say it would be fascinating. <laughs> well, you know, there is a 20-year auction, so you're just lucky I didn't really oh. talk about that today. Today, <laughs> uh, Jay Powell wait. is going to be testifying to the U.S. Senate panel. It will probably begin around 10 a.m. and continue throughout the day ahead of uh, the uh, Thursday testimony to the House. How much does he talk about the dollar as a potential global destabilizing liability? The stronger it gets, the more a lot of other nations are importing even more inflation and how much does that create a feedback loop that is problematic for a Federal Reserve that unfortunately or fortunately is central banker to the world when there is a crisis so often. Today there is a host of Fed speak including <coughs> Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin, Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans as well as Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker. We heard from Tom Barkin yesterday talking about what to expect when it comes to the uh, rate hikes particularly with July and a 75 basis point rate hike really in, in giving some pretty strong words about why they are expecting to raise so much more than they had been just a month ago. And then we have, of course, President Biden speaking probably around 2 p.m. on his proposal to suspend federal gas tax. Basically, theater, Tom, we've all decided that, but definitely a major issue heading into the midterm elections as gas still hovers around that $5 a gallon barrel. Yeah, it was really interesting with Anne-Marie Horton. We'll touch base with her this hour or the next. Can't remember, but uh, we'll talk to Anne-Marie here about uh, the president's eventful day as well. Emily Rowland is co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investments. She knows the difference between new John Hancock and old John Hancock in Boston. We're thrilled she can join us uh, today. I love, love, love in your note where you go to the X-axis, Emily, and say speed of cycle is everything. You note that the cycle right now is fast, 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 like the Red Sox recovery. Tell me about speed of cycle. Yeah, Tom, we're seeing the largest amount of uh, financial tightening that we've seen in decades here, and that is causing the cycle to age incredibly rapidly here. You know, we just saw this really swift uh, pricing in of a a global recession in the equity market. We're down now, of course, over 20 percent. We're about two thirds of the way there in terms of your average bear market. Uh, But on the fixed income side, bonds really haven't priced in this fast moving economic cycle. They're not even close to pricing in the potential here for a global recession in which our odds have have moved up here. So bond yields continue to rise. High yield bond spread sitting about 495 basis points right now. Yes, they've widened, but they're not even close to hitting their 20 year average or they're getting closer, but still not there. So we're seeing parts Mm -hmm. of the market that really haven't reflected the fact that we're moving ever closer to a late cycle environment and even a recession here. And we think that that offers some opportunities. Well, and let's go there, Emily, especially on the heels of what Paul Krugman was writing about earlier this week, the columnist and the uh, the prize winning economist talking about how we're not out of the free money era and that we're going to head right back to it when we hit recession, that yields are going to go back down. Is that what you're betting on and investing in longer term bonds? Yeah, it absolutely is. And in fact, we see this as almost a teeter totter where this year the Fed is clearly resolute in their unconditional efforts to to fight elevated inflation. And clearly the gloves are off here. But that teeter totter, we think, switches to the other side heading into 2023. We expect the Fed will be cutting rates and we expect they'll actually be laser focused on the other side of their dual mandate. Uh, which is dealing with a higher unemployment. We think that the Fed is probably going to need to bring the economy to the brink of recession, which clearly means uh, rising unemployment, and that's going to be a critical element next year. So normally, when you're thinking about higher unemployment, when you're thinking about global slowdown, when you're thinking about a recession, bond yields fall. You guys have talked a lot about these sort of traditional cross-asset relationships Uh, this morning. And I think that one's broken right now. So we do eventually see yields here topping out. And we think, look, you're getting 4% on the aggregate bond index. You haven't gotten that since 2010. 
Um, you know, so we think this is an attractive entry point. I, I tried to have a T-shirt made for this morning that said, I love bonds. Uh, it didn't <laughs> arrive in time, but I love bonds right now. You know, there's some Twitter people out there that are pretty good with Photoshop, so I bet they're able to take your appearance <laughs> and just kind of put that uh, on your outfit Perfect. this morning, Emily. Okay, so if you're buying bonds, how does that fit into your broader allocation of a portfolio? Does that mean you're shifting more toward bonds away from equities? What else is in there? We are, Kaylee. So heading into next quarter, we're going to be reducing our overweight to equities, bringing that down to neutral. Within equities, looking at higher quality parts of the market, adding to more defensive areas, the ones that are still on sale. A lot of the defensive sectors are now trading at very rich multiples, barbelling that with quality. So companies with great balance sheets, good return on equity, lots of cash on their balance sheet. Those are the proverbial baby that have been thrown out with the bathwater amidst this indiscriminate selling. So still owning equities, being more thoughtful about the ones that we own, and then again, notching up on fixed income. We're, we're notching down our allocation to credit, to bank loans, and we're looking at core as really the key opportunity here, treasuries, mortgage-backed securities. We expect those to see a bid here as the year progresses, as inflationary pressures come down. And as investors look towards safer parts of the market heading into right. the recession. Are you calling double digit equities up out one year? Well, I think that's a tough one to call here. I think that there could be some further weakness. And the key to me is that earnings estimates still haven't been revised down. Fair. Um, so yeah, I think fair. you could see more weakness here. We're waiting for that to happen. But again, it's just about looking at those opportunities within equities yeah. uh, for some relief. Emily, thank you. Emily Rowland uh, with us with John Hancock uh, this morning here as we try to discern the strategy. And Lisa, it really underscores the uncertainty out there. <laughs> well, so it, there's, it, it, yeah. there's almost a mystery to the uncertainty. So the rally over the next year reminds me of John Stoltzfus over at Oppenheimer, and he has yeah, one of the you. highest targets for the S&P at 53.30. And yesterday, Bloomberg spoke with him and said, do you really still think that's the case? And he says, yes, I see a 40 percent rally heading into the year end and that, yes, it's been a difficult call, but he still is, has conviction on this. How many people have to capitulate? We have not seen a capitulation on a lot of the individual price targets. When do some right. of these year end averages of north of 4,600 <laughs> start to come down? and way down yeah, okay. in, in the face of all of these recessionary right. calls. Kaylee, did Kellogg's capitulate yesterday? The answer is yes. Well, you could say that in the breakup into three companies. They're obviously trying to do that a little bit for a tax benefit. But obviously, corporations have to make decisions in that kind of environment. I would just point out, Stolfus far and away is the most bullish on the street. But you still have the likes of Credit Suisse, of J.P. Morgan, calling for something like a 30 percent rally. Yeah. They're still out at 4,900. Okay. It's a long way away from where we are this morning. Quote of the week. Lines on Kellogg, the three <laughs> divisions, snap, crackle, He's never gonna let you and pop. Down, ever. I thought it was brilliant. It was brilliant. <laughs> I mean, what, what can you say? Yeah, I mean, this wait, is Bloomberg. Is this like? I should just not even come in. Look, lines are on the show. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden wants Congress to do something about soaring gasoline prices. Bloomberg's learned he'll call on lawmakers today to enact a gasoline tax holiday. Average gas prices in the U.S. are around $5 a gallon. Federal taxes make up a little more than 18 cents of that. It's not clear how long the president wants to pause the tax. In the UK, inflation has risen to a new four-decade high. Prices rose 9.1% in May from a year ago. There were broad increases in the cost of everything, from fuel and electricity to food and beverages. There are also more signs of inflationary pressures building at the wholesale level. Raw material costs increased, increased the most on record. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has resumed lobbying of European Union officials. He's looking for support for Ukraine's bid to join the EU. That will come up at a summit in Brussels on Thursday. Zelensky is also urging the EU to come up with a seventh package of sanctions against Russia. The Senate has voted to advance a bipartisan gun safety bill and final passage is expected later this week. Back has called the measure the biggest breakthrough on the issue in decades. It's designed to improve background checks, securing schools and giving states federal funds to combat gun violence. And Bitcoin has resumed its fall. The largest cryptocurrency sank to just above that key $20,000 threshold. For months, cryptos have been moving in the same direction as stocks. 
Today's moves were no exception. Investor appetite for risk assets has been falling in the midst of fears about a recession. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Tory cuts and tax hikes hammer home. After 12 years in government, the Tories have left the UK economy in the doldrums. Yep. And it is a motion in the House of Commons in Parliament. You wonder if we're going to see this in America as well. It has been fierce now. The gentleman from Scotland speaking, but Starmer of the Labour Party and the Prime Minister of the Tory Party have really been going at it at a much greater level than, than I've seen in recent uh, times. Here's the Prime Minister. Let's listen. Global ...inflationary problem, but this government has the, uh, the fiscal firepower to, to deal with it, uh, Mr Speaker, and that is, I think, of benefit to the whole of the United Kingdom, including uh, Scotland, as we've yes. seen uh, throughout the uh, pandemic. And there's a, I think it's a matter of fact that taxes are actually highest of all uh, in Scotland, yeah. Mr Speaker. Ian Blackford. Sir Keir. Of course, we'll, we'll leave it there. Sure. That's a pro PMQs in the House of Commons. Lisa Bramwitz, very uh, quickly here. The backdrop here is simple $8.66 US a gallon in London. Which is a lot more there and frankly it's creating tensions around the world as uh, people bubble over and see that their incomes are going down on a very real basis. We uh, right now summarize this and move from the emotion of the floor of the House of Commons to the reality of careful academics and study at the International Energy Agency. Tim Gould of Johns Hopkins in Oxford leads their energy and economics coverage. We're thrilled that he could join us uh, today. An extraordinary time, Tim, to cut to the chase in the IEA report. What is the distinction that the prime minister and the leader of labor need to know? What do they need to know right now from IEA? I think one thing they need to know is that we simply haven't been putting enough capital into the energy sector in recent years. I'm, and that's true whether you look at it from the perspective of energy transitions. So we haven't been investing enough in clean. And then partially because we haven't done that, that means that the amount of money going into the traditional sector, so oil and gas, has also been in, not enough to avoid the sort of volatility that we're seeing today. Tim, I've got a really basic question. Has Russian oil actually been taken off the market or just re-diverted through China, through India and the refineries there and then sold back to the West? So there is um, clearly some impacts on Russia already of the measures that are in place. Um, but if you look at the data for exports, there hasn't been a huge amount of change since uh, the invasion in, in, in February. And so there is that evidence of a reorientation rather than a reduction when it comes to Russian flows into international markets. So who is pocketing the difference? I mean, if you're dealing with uh, the gas and, 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 and the crude that's being sold at a discount from Russia, and then it's being sold at anything but a discount everywhere else within the developed world, who's getting that delta? I mean, it's, it's, it's an unusually profitable moment to be in the refining business right now. I mean, there are, refining margins are very high, and refining margins are particularly high if your input crude is heavily discounted Russian crude. Well, but quickly here, Tim, there is this allegation that some people have that actually India and refineries there are benefiting on all sides and a lot of the gasoline and the refined goods the United States and other nations in the developed world are importing are actually Russian crude that just have been funneled into a form that they can use. Is that accurate? I think it's very difficult to tell the, the, the provenance of the molecules that, that come out of a refinery. There's no, there's no way to distinguish uh, the outputs of a refinery based on the uh, normally based on the on the on the origins of the crude so i think that's a, that's a very difficult uh, question to answer directly Okay, Tim, well, you're an economist, and as the Biden administration pushes Congress to enact a pause on the gasoline tax here in America to provide some relief at the pump, will that actually work as intended, even if it got through Congress? I think, I mean, we're very focused on the underlying dynamics, and the fact is that um, oil and gas upstream investment has come down by half since uh, 2014. And that's 
added to some of the pressures that we see on markets today. So what we're focused on is which way do we get out of today's, uh, today's crisis? And, and essentially, there's two baskets of options. One is around doubling down on, on fossil fuels, and, and the other one is investing in, in, in new areas of, uh, of, uh, of the energy economy. Um, and certainly from an IEA perspective, uh, we're very keen that the upswing that we've seen in clean energy investment in 2022, we're keen to see that gain further momentum because we think that's the only lasting way out of the uh, crisis that we're having today. Well, and Tim, of course, by nature, it is a transition. We don't just arrive at a moment in which we are entirely reliant on clean energy. You still need fossil fuels there as a backstop because many of these clean energy sources are intermittent by nature. The sun doesn't always shine. The wind isn't always blowing. How do both of these things play together where we can't wean ourselves off of fossil fuels? You can't get to green energy at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's one of the things that we try and avoid saying is that there's a very sort of binary, clean, dirty element. You just need to scale up one and reduce the other. There is this sort of coexistence of energy systems for many, many years to come. And you need to make sure that all parts of that system are functioning in a way right. that allows us to have affordable, secure energy. So I very much agree. You know, we need to focus all, also on all of the energy services, the reliability that you can still get from uh, traditional forms of supply. Uh, Tim Gould, the, the, the thickness of the IEA effort here, I think of Adam Siminski's work over the years, and then I look at Christian Malik and J.P. Morgan, where in 100 pages they say the foundation of all of this is population growth in emerging markets. You own this at IEA. You've had the courage to go beyond the developed countries and look at emerging markets as well. Is the case for higher oil prices simply a burgeoning population in emerging markets? I think, it's, I think it's more than that. It's about the economic growth. It's the rising incomes. It's the aspirations that many people in emerging yeah. markets and developing economies have uh, for, for the lifestyles that, that, uh, that we have in many uh, advanced uh, economies. And that is going to drive developments in the energy sector for many years to come. But the question is, what sort of model are these countries going to be pursuing? Is it the same one? Is it the same path that we've trodden all these years? Or is there a, right. a new lower emissions path that is now available because of some of the uh, increasingly accessible uh, and affordable clean technologies that are on the market? Tim, thank you so much for this report from the uh, International Energy Association. Uh, Tim Gould with us there this morning. Lisa, this really is in the J.P. Morgan report as well. Starving people in EM or burgeoning middle class in EM, they have aspirations. And those aspirations center around use of energy. That's the heart and soul of the J.P. Morgan call. Which actually begins, oh, or ends, I should say, where we began, which is that tension bubbling up and how that manifests itself as we head right. toward a J.P. Morgan call of $150 a barrel. Are we going to get a two-year yield under 3% in nine basis points right now, Lisa, 3.10%? That's starting to get my attention. Wait, seriously? Bonds yeah. are starting to get your attention? Bonds get my wow. attention. Wow. <laughs> Breaking news. Yeah, I actually find this really interesting that you're actually seeing, even as you have the hawks and the Fed, talking up hawkishness and even more hawkishness. You have a rally in bonds, especially as people look out to this recessionary call in the nearer term than perhaps people previously thought. Futures at negative 47, the VIX 31.08. Please stay with us. Kaylee Lines in for John Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance. We look at equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Oil down 124. The Yanks there down to a 110 uh, level. Commodities generally giving it back. Dollar pretty much resilient. 104.51 on the blended big big country DXY. Uh, yen very importantly 136.20 really doesn't give way. A persistently weak yen, I would say. Sterling, as we have uh, heat in the House of Commons right now, we looked at that a moment ago. Sterling, a 122.47. Pound sterling can't get out of its way. Either can Lisa Bramowitz. She's got an individual stock story. And I know this, this is going to be shocking here. to you, Tom, but they're all down because today it's a gloomy uh, it's, Wednesday. There we go. You know, today is a new day when it comes to the relationship of oil to this inflationary backdrop. There has been a shift where suddenly the inflation, 
that's going to cause potentially a recession if you trust the likes of Bill Dudley, who will be joining us here shortly. Uh, th this will actually impede the demand for oil, and you're seeing that with oil prices down, and you're seeing commensurate declines across the board in some of the majors uh, mm. in the oil sphere. Chevron, interesting, notably because of the tit-for-tat yesterday between President Biden, who uh, shot back at the Chevron CEO, who said, guys, we need more clarity, we need more supportive policies for the oil industry for us to be able to produce more. And then President Biden came back with, I didn't know you guys were so sensitive. Well, those shares down uh, nearly 3 percent. Exxon Mobil shares down about the same percent. This is really in sympathy with what we're seeing in the crude space. And then Occidental down about 3 percent. I wanted to take a look at a couple of the winners and losers even after yesterday's uh, rally. Tesla was one of the big winners yesterday, up more than 9 percent after Elon Musk talked about job cuts and gave a little bit more clarity, maybe, on Twitter. Uh, those shares now falling one and a half percent as people reassess and because of this sort of broad based risk off field. Netflix and Meta are interesting. Facebook because yesterday they did not participate in the rally. Netflix actually uh, is suspected to announce another round of job cuts after really beefing up during the pandemic. Those shares down about one percent and Meta has really been left out time. I mean some of the losses in the big tech space just shocking and a lot of people saying not yeah. time yet to get mm. back in one of the big bets about what could potentially drive a rally. This is it right at what point is there uh, value in names that really were bid up on ultra low rates for so many years. The Bramo stock check. <laughs> we only show red on the screen. Thank you, Lisa, for <laughs> Anytime. doing that. Romaine would have done it differently. There's no question about that. John Farrow, Lisa, uh, Kaylee Lines, rather, in for John Farrow with Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene. And now we're going to go a little bit inside baseball. You can do that with Patrick Garvey, head of global debt and rate strategy at ING Financial. Patrick, you, you talk a lot about the dynamic, the flows into what I call the trust market, which years ago was indicative of the TED spread, the dynamics against treasury bills and just the thermometer, the measurement of the very short-term paper. Suddenly, the TED spread jumps up. Should I care? It's up, uh, Tom, but it's, 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 it's not anything dramatic so far. One of the things I've been really impressed with is systemic risk is relatively subdued, which may seem like a strange thing to say given the sell-off and risk assets. But if you look at where banks print CP mm -hmm. relative to the risk-free rate, it's, it's relatively subdued. Now, it's up, as you say, it is up, but we're not anywhere near at panic levels. Uh, the banks are holding up and the system is holding up quite well, in fact. Are we not at panic levels because we had so much fiscal stimulus that there's so much money sloshing around in the system that there's just so much money we don't have to panic, just that simple? That's been a real comfort blanket, uh, Tom. It's, it's been there, of course, since the pandemic, and it remains in play. One of the things I really missed from the last FOMC meeting was commentary on this, because, you know, you mentioned the TED spread. I mean, the other dynamic on the front end is SOPR, which is our risk-free rate here in the U.S., which is now 10 basis points below the Fed's reverse repo uh, facility rate and five basis points below the Fed funds floor, which is not a good look, and it does reflect this excess of liquidity. It's not helped risk assets, but it's certainly pushing down repo rates. We're speaking with Porik Garvey, Garvey uh, head of global debt and rate strategy over at ING. And I am curious, Porik, a lot of people trying to game out what a recession would look like. When you look at the credit space, the bottom up analysis, what are we pricing in in terms of the type of recession based on the credit spreads currently priced in? So credit spreads are pretty wide. I mean, if you look at a spectrum of, of wideness, we're, we're at that level where things can begin to creak in terms of an elevation of default risk. Because again, one of the real positives of the here and now is that defaults, actual defaults, are historically low. So what I see with, the, with this elevation of credit spreads is a pickup in defaults as we go into 2023 and we have a slowdown. Um, we're not there yet, though. I hear a lot of talk about imminent recession. We have a really strong labor market here in the U.S., and that's the ultimate test of whether we're in recession or not. We're not there yet. Wait, hold on a second, Part. This is really interesting, especially as you get Bill Dudley, who's coming on next, saying that a recession is imminent in the next 12 to 18 months. You're saying not so much. How much does that view hinge on a Federal Reserve that backpedals away from the Volcker-esque policies that at least is in their rhetoric when they uh, testify and when they have just given out their 75 basis point rate hike? 
Yeah, I think we have to define imminent, uh, Lisa. Uh, 12 to 18 months is quite some way away from today. If we're talking about 2023, I'm fully on board with the severe slowdown camp. But we're still in 2022. It's just June. And I, I, you know, from a bond market perspective, there's a lot of talk about, you know, should rates be falling here, market rates falling. They have come off the highs. But I don't see it just yet. I see a lot of reasons for rates market rates to rise further from here, which I, which I can go into, but it, it, we're just not there yet. Speaking of we're not there yet, we have barely begun, Porik, quantitative tightening. I mean, June isn't even over. We're only a couple weeks into this. How far away are we from seeing the actual real impact of that rate hikes aside? I think we're a good 12 months away, uh, Haley, to be honest. I mean, it, 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 this is one of the anomalous situations that the, the Fed is doing 50 billion per month to begin with, then 100 billion. So before we get real traction there, I mean, I think that, you know, you look at the cash going back to the Fed, it's uh, two and a quarter trillion dollars going back to the Fed on the reverse repo facility. I mean, that tells me that the Fed needs to get that balance sheet down by one or two trillion before we have a real impact. So we're talking about 12 to 18 months before there is an impact from that, uh, that policy unwind. Yeah, of course, everything operates with a lag. As for how this translates directly into the Treasury market, what are your expectations about not just what the nominal yield is going to do as it balances the expectation of higher rates with these growth concerns, but also where that is going to be driven from? Is it real yields or break-evens? Oh, it's absolutely real yields uh, going forward. Uh, we've been talking about this for the past uh, few months. Uh, back in March, we had a, a real yield in the U.S. minus 120 basis points. It's now 60. So that's a big move, but 60 is still low. And this is one of the reasons to why we do think rates can rise from here because, you know, typically before the pandemic, the real yield was up around 1% in the 10 year. And that seems to me to be still a very sensible target given that this, this economy is still hot on the labor market. So that's the first thing. Second thing I'm looking at is the, the five year on the curve, getting a bit technical here. It's not signaling that the rise in rate is over. It's still trading quite cheap to the curve. It's a classic sign that the Fed has got a big job to do and that market rates still have some rising to do. Now, having said that, I am expecting rates to peak this quarter. We're just not there yet. Well, as you said, peak this quarter. What is your terminal rate here? As we go to Bill Dudley, we'll have in a moment, uh, folks, with a, a blistering hard landing memo today. Mr. Garvey, what is your terminal rate then for the Fed that Mr. Powell needs to describe later this morning? 375, Tom, is where we think it gets to. So it just falls short of 4%. Gets done by the end of this year, and the market should discount that in Q3, which leaves Q4 and next year as a period during which we can see market rates fall. This has been the biggest bear market in modern times. Plenty of room for some positive times for bonds once we get beyond this right. quarter and we discount cuts next year. Now, Patrick Garvey, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it with ING. And Lisa, that uh, alludes back to Margie Patel earlier where I looked at the high yield Bloomberg total return index. And it's just, I, I'm, still, I'm still not there. It's something I've never seen as Mr. Garvey alludes to. Uh, the, the idea of double-digit declines, in this case, high yield prices, I believe it was a negative 12 percent. Which is the reason why Pork was talking about what is getting priced in, and he doesn't see defaults getting to the level that per currently is getting priced in by spreads. The reason why some people are saying, including Emily Rowland, we love bonds because there actually <laughs> is value. I want to highlight this, Tom. Uh, Andrew Hollenhorst over at City Please. just publishing about what to expect from Chair Powell today. This sort of reiteration of a message that inflation is too high and the Fed is determined to bring it down. And he really highlighted this. And I think that this underlines the moment and kind of the feeling right now, while not new, the repetition of this message as markets increasingly price in the risk of a near-term recession increases the hawkishness of the message. This reiteration that they are committed to 2%, how much does that really emphasize the, the bearishness that you're seeing seep into markets today? Let me ask the two of you, Kaylee, let me start with you. Do you discern a difference or a nuance recession to recession? Because those of us older do. 
Well, I think that's the question, and that's kind of the conversation that you are having now. It's not just about whether or not we're going to get a recession or even what time it arrives. It's how deep it will be. Is it going to be short-lived, or is it going to be one that is very yeah. difficult to come out from? I think the nuances do indeed matter here because the fact of the matter, Tom, is that this recession will be also very different than anyone we have had in the past, just as the pandemic very short-lived recession was. The question is going to be how short-lived yeah. will this be when it eventually arrives. Let me do a data check here because we're going to get to Bill Dudley. Please all all of you on radio and television, stay with us. We're going to look at the news, a very busy day, and then uh, get to Dr. Dudley. Futures negative 47. The VIX, it's a little better tape than 20 minutes ago, an hour ago, but still uh, a negative tape, negative 47 with a VIX, 31.07. I should mention Bitcoin with a print under 20,000 overnight, 20,500 on Bitcoin right now. And the 10-year yield, 3.5. 20% in a lower yield by eight basis points. Please stay with us. Bill Dudley is next. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Boeing CEO sees supply chain issues lasting until the end of next year. David Kalun also told Bloomberg's Guy Johnson that's not the industry's only problem. We have a very large, sophisticated, and somewhat fragile supply chain behind the airplane manufacturers. And just as fragile, it turns out, are the operators themselves, the airlines, and the ability to staff up with pilots, the ability to staff up the ground crews, maintenance crews, etc. Kalun was interviewed at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha. Bloomberg's learned that President Biden will call on Congress to enact a gasoline tax holiday. The president's expected to make a statement today. Average gasoline prices are around $5 a gallon in the U.S. and they typically rise in the summer. Federal taxes are 18.4 cents a gallon. It's not clear how long the president wants the tax to be paused. The CEO of Deutsche Bank sees a growing risk of a global recession as the global economy battles multiple strains from supply chain issues to rising food prices. Christian Seving spoke at the Future of Finance Summit over in Frankfurt. It's always hard to put a percentage, uh, but um, at least I would say we have a 50% likelihood um, of a recession um, globally, um, but also uh, in Europe. Seving also said that volatility will be the theme for the next 12 to 24 months. Ford has picked its factory in Valencia, Spain to build electric vehicles and the American automaker will wind down a plant in Germany by the middle of the decade. Ford says it will talk with unions about significant job cuts at both plants because electric vehicles require fewer workers to produce them. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tape, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. in a situation where inflation is high, it's broad-based, it's persistent, and rates are still well below normal. And so I think the spirit is you want to get uh, back to where you want to go as fast as you can uh, without breaking anything. A really important conversation with a gentleman from Richmond. Richmond has a different economics in the air. Mr. Barkin there with important comments on uh, the item of the moment, recessions in America. The chairman will speak today. It will be a sober conversation, a sober set of Q&A. And part of it will be reading William Dudley's essay for Bloomberg Opinion this morning, where Bill Dudley, the former president of the New York Fed, of course, for decades at Goldman Sachs, simply says, learn how to spell it. It is a hard landing. Bill Dudley, how do you know or discern a recession coming? The distinction of a 1994 soft landing, looking at a Goldilocks recession, if you will, of Greenspan, or a more difficult recession, how do you get out front of that intellectually? I don't think it has to be a really deep recession. I mean, deep recessions typically occur when something breaks, like the global financial crisis is a good example of that. I think what the Federal Reserve has to do is generate enough slack in the economy bring down inflation. That means the unemployment rate has to go up. The problem that the Fed has is it's very hard to push the unemployment rate up only a little bit. Every time the unemployment rate's gone up by more than a half a percent, you've had a full-blown recession. There's no reason to think that it's going to be any different this time. Will the chairman today say what you say in your essay that suddenly 
employment as a mandate is subservient. Is that where we're heading? Well, that's what the Fed already sort of told us in their FOMC statement. They took out the reference to the labor market remaining so strong. Uh, they're very much focused now on inflation uh, as opposed to employment because the labor market is too tight as opposed to not tight enough. So I think he'll reiterate the message that we heard, that we heard in his press conference uh, last week. I think also, though, he will not talk about a hard landing. The Fed is still going for a soft landing. And of course, they should. The problem is it's just going to be very difficult for them to pull this off. Bill, a lot of people in the market right now are trying to draw a distinction between a soft recession or a shallow one and one that is much more damaging. What is the characteristic of the hard landing you envision? Well, I think it's going to be a relatively mild recession at this point because uh, the Fed, the, the financial system looks like it's pretty solid. Household and business balance sheets look like they're pretty solid. You really get a deep downturn when things in the financial system break and the ability to supply credit to people becomes impaired. I don't expect that to happen this time. Uh, so I, I would expect a mild recession like 1990 or, or, or 2001, uh, not a deep recession like 73, 74 or, of course, the great financial crisis. A lot of people would push back, Bill, and say that this Fed has no appetite for causing a recession. They don't seem to want to do that, and that they will eventually pivot away from raising rates as much as people currently expect. Why do you think that's not the case? Why do you think they're going to take a page from Paul Volcker? Well, I don't think they want a recession. The problem is that if you're going to get inflation down, you need more slack in the economy. And it's very hard to generate more slack in the economy without actually generating uh, recession. So that they're, they're, they're definitely going for a soft lane. It's just going to be almost impossible for them to pull it off. But is the assumption you're making, Bill, that they're not going to blink even when the data turns more dramatically than we already have seen it having? I mean, Larry Summers was talking about a 5% unemployment rate over the next five years. Where do you think their tolerance is? Well, I think that I think what Larry's talking about is certainly reasonable. I think the reason why they're not going to blink at the end of the day is they know that if they blink, and don't get inflation down, then they have to do even more later. Postponing procrastination is not a great option. We saw what happened in the 1960s and 70s when the Federal Reserve was slow to tackle inflation. What happened was inflation got out of hand and Paul Volcker had to come in and put the U.S. economy through the ringer. So the Fed wants to do what's necessary in the near term so they don't have to do a lot more in the longer term. But it is in the longer term that you really see the full effects of monetary policy taking shape. It operates with a lag. We all understand that. So I guess the question is, if they're front-loading and aggressive, is are they going to see it reflected in the actual data we're getting, or do they risk just moving way too aggressively and then the data turns all at once? Well, that's, that's what could actually happen, because right now the economy has considerable forward momentum uh, as the economy re reopens and payroll gains are very strong. Uh, household balance sheets are still very solid, boosted by the fiscal stimulus that we got over the last couple of years. But beneath that, things are trouble. Uh, inflation is rising faster than wages. Uh, financial conditions have tightened a great deal. So what I think is going to happen is the economy is going to be fine over the next you know, few months. Uh, and then we're going to see a very sharp slowdown uh, probably in the first half of 2023. Bill, I just want to build on something that Kaylee was talking about with that 5% unemployment figure from Larry Summers over the next five years, and that that's what he thinks is necessary to bring inflation down. What happens if you start to see the unemployment numbers climb, but the inflation figures do not come down because of those lag effects, like rents, for example, that are continuing to climb? How does the Fed handle that based on your conversations and your experience on the central bank? Well, I think you're right that inflation is probably not going to come down that quickly because there are lags in, in price rate and in, in companies raising prices. Also, I think the Ukraine-Russia war complicates things enormously because it looks like the energy price shock and the food shock is going to last longer because of the war. So I think that the Fed has gotten very unlucky in terms of the kind of inflation shocks that we're seeing. They're likely to be persistent, and that's going to make, make it difficult for the Fed to reverse course. Bill Dudley, I, uh, John Taylor's at a school. You may know it across the bay from Berkeley. It's Stan Stanford, I think is what it's called. And I can just see John Taylor with a full balloon in his freshman economics class letting the air out of it ever so slowly. We have a fiscal balloon, some 30 percent of GDP. How long will it take to let the air out of that fiscal balloon? Is a central bank, is that a three-year project or do you really see it out almost to a decade? 
I don't think it should take as long as a decade, but fiscal policy is a factor behind why we're probably going to see a sharp slowdown at some point. Because fiscal policy, while it has been very stimulative over the last two years, that stimulus is over. Uh, we've also seen households begin to pull down their savings rate. So the savings rate was very elevated as the fiscal policy stimulus was being put in place. But the savings rate now has already fallen below its long run average, which tells you that consumers are a little bit stressed, are starting to be, experience a little bit of stress in terms of their balance sheets. Bill Dudley, required reading, folks, before the testimony of Chairman Powell, the Humphrey Hawkins testimony, a monetary report by the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And we'll get uh, Bill Dudley out on social here as quick as we can. You can see that, of course, at Bloomberg.com. He speaks of a hard uh, landing uh, uh, is, is well. I, you know, Bill, I look at this and I think if Jerome Powell was to read your essay you wonder how he would amend his discussion today. I mean, he's not going to say hard landing, but how does he give up the, how does he address the probabilities, the set of outcomes that we may see? Well, he's made it more clear that it's going to be more difficult. The longer inflation stays as high as it's been, the harder the Fed's job is. And he's, he's admitted that in his, his press conference. So I think today he's going to make it clear that it, this is not going to be easy. He's going to tell, talk about that there is a path to a soft landing. I think that path is extraordinarily narrow. He won't talk about how narrow that path is. He'll just talk about that's what the Federal Reserve is trying to seek and pull off this time. Bill, what kind of financial breaking do you foresee being a trigger for the Fed? And I say this as the yen weakens to the weakest levels we've seen versus the dollar since 1998. And people are starting to get concerned about deteriorating liquidity in certain bond markets. Well, I think the biggest area of stress, frankly, is going to be low and moderate income countries who are hurt by, one, a stronger dollar, higher grain prices and higher energy prices. For poorer countries, grain and energy is a pretty significant portion of the household consumption basket. So they're going to hit, be hit very severely over the next 12 to 18 months. So I expect a lot of sovereign debt problems uh, in, in the next year or two. And that's going to just be more problematic for the global economy. So, Bill, at what point does a strong dollar create a real issue? And this is something that I was thinking about, especially as a growing number of investors see the dollar as the main hedge against equity weakness. At what point is it a trigger for the Fed? Well, the Fed actually is not unhappy with the dollar being stronger because a stronger dollar holds down U.S. inflation by making import prices cheaper. And it also slows down the economy by reducing U.S. export competitiveness. So when you think about the Fed wants tighter financial conditions, higher bond yields, weaker stock prices, stronger dollar, the dollar is actually the most attractive of those three things because a stronger dollar actually increases your purchasing power. So the dollar strength is not something that the Federal Reserve views as a bug. They view this as a feature. Well, speaking of the financial markets, we heard from Tom Barkin yesterday. We will again today, but he essentially said that you want to get back to where you want to go as fast as you can without breaking anything, talking about not wanting to cause undue harm, not just to the economy, but to financial markets. What harm would that be? What would make the Fed put kick back in, Bill? I think you'd have to see some sort of uh, calamity in financial markets that impeded market function, impeded the ability of banks to lend money to households and businesses. I don't expect that. I think the reforms that we made uh, following the great financial crisis in terms of the banking system, more capital, more liquidity, better risk management, better governance, those have shown to work, and I think they'll work this time as yeah. well. Bill, I just want to say in your wonderful essay, I don't know which is more important, that you quoted the great economist Claudia Sam or you quoted the other economist Wiley Coyote. I'll let you decide which one. I think that's uh, uh, great to see here. Bill Dudley, thank you so much, the former president of the New York Fed. I think, Lisa, it's great to talk about the Sam rule, which really speaks to the dynamics of what a central bank has to deal with in employment. But the single sentence, Lisa, from uh, Mr. Dudley, personal savings rate, with all the challenges of inflation now for the country, moving from 27 percent to 4 percent. That is jaw dropping. And it's something. That. Yeah. And it's something that people are talking about as we do get uh, as people eating into their savings to keep their spending up at a time when inflation is running at the fastest pace in 40 years. This idea of a recession and the contours of what kind of recession it will be is the debate of the moment. It is no longer how likely it is to avoid that kind of downturn, but how painful it will be and what the scars will be. And that, to me, is interesting to note in some of the rhetoric we're hearing out of Wall Street 
Street banks and investors. And of course, Wiley Coyote, I think he's out of Berkeley as well, a little bit behind Dudley. But Wiley Coyote, of course, making clear in a recent research report, we are at the Bramo Cliff. I mean, <laughs> there's just no question. I mean, come on, Lisa, there's no question about that. Yeah, Wiley Coyote really likes Tang <clears throat> and Velveeta. It's well, really, you know, it quoted, goes to the same genre. <laughs> quoted by Dr. Dudley, I should say, folks, I really suggest a quick skim of that essay here before uh, we hear from Chairman Powell. Uh, Kaylee, what will you uh, listen for from Chairman Powell today? I think it's more about the words he chooses not to say than the words that he does, Tom. Will he I actually agree. utter totally agree. the word recession? Well, I, I, I may not say that, but I totally agree. It's about what he avoids today as being germane. Futures steady, a negative 50 on S&P. Uh, futures down, futures negative 358. Yields in seven basis points. Recession in the air. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. We are seeing signs that consumers are likely pulling back on spending. We're one hurricane or one major refinery outage away from a significant uptick. We have crude structurally aiming higher. A lot of this demand, I think that is going to abate over time. The consumer, we think, can come out of this, but it will be a consumer-led recession. Even if you were to get a recession, it's likely to be a very mild one. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. And we're examining the contours of a recession. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio and Television. Tom Keene, John Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow off. Kaylee Lines very much in, which is a wonderful thing. And it is a gloomy day in markets, Tom. It is yes. hard to see whether Fed Chair Jay Powell will say anything to uh, really address that in a positive way or, frankly, whether he wants to. Well, it's become more important, I would suggest, in the last number of hours. Some of that's international with the continued weakness in Japanese yen. Some, you know, some sophisticated angst out there and maybe uh, distant for our radio listeners and television viewers. But the fact is, there it is. He's not going to discuss Japan directly, but he's got to discuss here how central banks, Lisa, are adapting to inflation, 9.1%. In the United Kingdom. Sophisticated angst. I like that. The sophisticated angst of a yen that's the weakest since 1998. At what point does something start to break? Tom, is that a stress point? I think when you that's going to come see, up. Uh, the yen at that level. No, I really think that this idea of we're in control. Obviously, you know, as we just heard from Bill Dudley, we have a chairman who's going to say, hey, we're in control. We've got it. Uh, we've, we've got everything in order. But the, the question you're going to hear from the senators is simply what could lead this to break? And they've got a long list of worries, just like you do. Yeah, and Kaylee, a lot of people are looking at stock valuations after what we've seen, the bear market, and how much things have gotten beaten up and saying, we've already priced in something that looks like a shallow recession, as even Bill Dudley seems to project out. So are we starting to see the beginning of a new investment cycle? I mean, it's sort of a counter to some of the gloom that we hear out of prognosticators. Yeah, well, it's a question on how much you think the market does need to price in. Will the recession actually be shallow? If you listen to Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, he says this market is not prepared whatsoever for the kind of economic downturn we're going to see, which is why he's looking all the way down to 3,000. Yet you still have, as you pointed out in the last hour, Lisa, John Stoltzfus over at Oppenheimer out at 53.30 for the S&P 500 at year end. Where are futures this morning? 37.15? Yeah. yeah, he's expecting a 40% rally, and you've seen that in the single names as well. Uh, Bespoke uh, Capital came out with a study showing that the divergence between where stocks are and where they are priced to be by individual stock analysts is the widest that it's been, or one of the widest, going back to 2000. Where is the capitulation, and have we seen it already in price, Kaylee? Well, I think that's the question. We've all been looking for capitulation for months now, and we never really seem to see that kind of disorderly selling pressure. For the large part, it's been quite orderly. There is a kind of a pattern and consistency to this market. It hasn't really felt like you get that, what do we call it, a cathartic yeah. A cathartic puke? Yeah, I've, I've been instructed. Did Tom just wince I've been, I've been instructed that? that. No, he wants the sophisticated <laughs> angst, Tom. The sophisticated <laughs> angst can be felt in the dollar, and the dollar strength is the pervasive move, and we talk about the flip side of that, which is the weak yen. But the <clears> strong <throat> dollar uh, really has been the uniting theme over all of these risk-off days, the remaining well, hedge at a time when bonds, as you've pointed out many times, have been unreliable. And, and something that maybe speaks to the difference of a more unionized continental Europe and London and the United Kingdom versus 
is now, but the drama, folks, for those of you in America, the drama in the United Kingdom right now is tangible. Lisa witnessing Sterling can't get out of its way, 122.46. They have the biggest railway strike in 30 years. This, this goes back literally to Thatcher. And it's at a time when people are relying more on public transportation because of the cost of petrol and the fact oh, that it has been petrol. rising as much as it is. Very much risk off across the board right now. <clears throat> as we see uh, that pervasive decline, yeah. we can see uh, the S&P clawing back a little bit off earlier lows. 1.4% decline. NASDAQ down 151, 1 1.5%. And you can see bonds getting a bid in. And to me, this is the change. And it really comes in tandem with crude uh, going <clears throat> down to one down now more than 5%, Tom. Bad news is now bad news for oil because a recession is yeah. not going to be good for demand when you have people who are going to decide not to drive or not to fly. The petrol dis uh, d distinction right now, $8.66 in the United Kingdom versus $5 whatever here uh, in America. Someone that has seen the arc of this, Lisa Shallot, from the mating of Alliance Capital and Sanford Bernstein years ago over to her duties as Chief Investment Officer at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Been there, done that. She has seen the dreaded conversation of recession. Lisa, how foolish is it for Morgan Stanley clients to angst over the guesstimates of what recession will be? Look, I, I, we've always said um, that you know it's it's foolish for for clients to to try to guess. I mean, one of the things uh, that we were talking about with clients yesterday is, um, you know, e even you know some of the the folks who get paid to do this, i.e., at the Fed, uh, have never gotten recession forecasts correct, ever. Uh, I think this is something that uh, David Rosenberg also wrote about yesterday. Uh, in in his wonderful uh, piece that he puts out daily, um, and and the fact of the matter is, you know, the best we can do is um, try to ascertain direction uh, and relative order of magnitude. And other than that, I don't think we can try to, you know, hand ring about you know where the bottom is uh, and you know how far will it go and and what you know is going to be affected until we're really you know kind of in it. Well, hand wringing aside, when you look at the tea leaves and this idea that certain tech companies in particular are starting to lay off uh, at members of their staff or cut back on hiring plans, Lisa, have we entered a new phase of the economic cycle that is beginning on the edges and requires a shift in strategy? I, look, I, I think that we're um, actually, you know, as you know, markets always, you know, are, are six to, to nine months ahead. Uh, of reality, I do. I am in the camp um, that that the price action we have seen thus far, this bear market, uh, has probably discounted uh, at least you know two thirds to seven eighths of the way there uh, to what we're guessing, and I, I use the word guessing, uh, is going to be um, a shallow recession. Um, in that spirit, I think what's different about the labor market this time. Uh, is that, you know, we have never had um, the number of job openings and the ratio of job openings um, to applicants that, you know, we came into this period having. And so while we are starting to see some modest uptick uh, in layoffs from, you know, some uh, handful of companies, um, I think that, that what's going to be different this time uh, is that labor and the unemployment rate is actually going to hold up much better because we have this cushion that what companies will do first uh, is eliminate their job openings as opposed to uh, going immediately to, to firings and staff reductions. Well, on the subject of labor, higher labor costs obviously are one of the higher cost companies are facing, raising the question of margin pressure as there's continued kind of inflationary dynamics in this economy. What are your thoughts on the trajectory of margins from here, Lisa, and if, if expectations of them are still too high? Uh, absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, I, you know, back in the fourth quarter, uh, of last year, one of the things, you know, that we were, you know, trying to be very loud about uh, was the unsustainability of margins. We felt that, you know, when we were seeing these peak operating margins for the S&P 500 well into the double digits, uh, you know, profits as a share of GDP where they were, um, that we were witnessing, you know, record operating leverage that was a result of this mismatch between, um, you know, the pricing power that companies had 
uh, at the beginning of the reopening uh, of the economy and their actual costs. And there are lags uh, mm. because of the way we account for inventory and the way right. we hire uh, and the way you know we expense CapEx right. and things of that nature. Now we're in the catch up phase. And our view is that margins are, are really gonna be vulnerable. And this has been one of the you know great mysteries, I think, um, is why the sell side has been so, so, so complacent well, that's with right. regard to I, earnings estimates. Lisa, this is critical. This is right where I wanted to go, running out of time. If the sell side has been complacent, are we going to be surprised by corporate use of cash that shrinks? Uh, potentially. And and I think that, that, you know, this has been the problem, is that the sell side analysts have stopped actually doing work uh, since the era of, you know, Reg FD and, you know, they just listen to what executives say and executives oh. don't want to say anything um, until the exact minute. Uh, oh, that, Lisa. That it's their my, lawyers it's let them say It's our third rail, Lisa. I've been screaming here. You don't see this, folks, off camera. But I've been screaming about Reg FD and the effect here on surprise. I mean, Lisa, it's tangible. They can't talk yes. until they're right there. They can't talk until they're right there, and the analysts ha have stopped doing work, and they just listen to the words coming out of the mouths of either corporate management or uh, our Federal Reserve chairman. It, it is really awful, and you know investors are smarter than that. Uh, and our guess is is that you know there is a, a large amount of the earnings disappointment that has been priced in. Um, we just need to see those estimate cuts. Uh, kick in so that we can ascertain what is the real price earnings ratio of this market. I mean, right now, uh, I think it's a, a bit artificial. Bottle it. Lisa Shallot there with a quote of the week. <laughs> Lisa Shallot, Morgan Stanley, thank you so much. Lisa, Lisa looks at me like, what are you talking about? And the answer, Lisa. folks, is Reg FD <laughs> changed the way the sell side communicates with corporations. And this is the first time, Lisa, we've really hit full face can they can Netflix say how bad things are until a precise moment where they say how bad things are? In other There's words, no warning. Right. And are we going to get more Amazon type moments where suddenly you get a complete rethink of what the outlook is? Yeah. And it really is not telegraphed in any kind of way uh, that <clears> is normal. And how much does it take for the analysts to actually capitulate right. on their expectations uh, ahead of that? I, will, I was a card carrying member of the Fun for Lunch Bunch where you'd go listen to corporations. And I can tell you, folks, within five days after Reg FD came in, those lunches dramatically changed because their lawyers were afraid of what corporations uh, could say. This is important, equally important. Our interview of the day on Foreign Exchange, Mark McCormick, uh, coming up here. Futures at negative 54, the VIX, 31.06. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden wants Congress to do something about soaring gasoline prices. Bloomberg's learned he'll call on lawmakers today to enact a gasoline tax holiday. Average gas prices in the U.S. are around $5 a gallon. Federal taxes make up a little more than 18 cents of that. It's not clear how long the president wants to pause the tax. In the UK, inflation has risen to a new four-decade high. Prices rose 9.1% in May from a year ago. There were broad increases in the cost of everything from fuel and electricity to food and beverages. There are also more signs of inflationary pressures building at the wholesale level. Raw material costs increased the most on record. North Korea's Kim Jong-un may be setting the stage for his first nuclear test since 2017. For the first time in a year, Kim convened a top-level meeting of the country's military. One of the key elements of North Korea's strategy is testing miniaturized nuclear warheads to fit on a new generation of solid fuel missiles. And the Senate has voted to advance a bipartisan gun safety bill, and final passage is expected later this week. Backers call the measure the biggest breakthrough on the issue in decades. It's designed to improve background checks, securing schools, and giving states federal funds to combat gun violence. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. 
Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month and all year long. It's a market where the Fed is working against you. Financial conditions are tightening, and that means you need to be patient. There's pressure on the ECB. There's pressure on the Bank of England. There's pressure on the Bank of Australia. A lot of countries right now are playing catch up when it comes to getting inflation under control. There is international economics now, as described by Russ Kosterich of BlackRock yesterday, Chairman Powell this morning. Lisa saying headlines coming out. Help me again, Lisa. 9.30, we see headlines, and then opening statements at 10, yeah. and then finally he speaks. Well, and the opening statement is expected to be short and a reiteration of what he's already said. Yeah. What I'm more interested in is the questioning and, frankly, the answering. What does he avoid saying, as Kaylee pointed out earlier? Right. And how much does he double it down on this idea that they <clears> are willing to to spur a recession right. if that's what it takes to bring inflation down. Kaylee Lines with us today. John Farrow out on a well-deserved week. Is it a week or two weeks he's off, Lisa? I can't remember. It's one week, and it's well-deserved. He's well -deserved. British, so, you know. And it's not a vacation. It's like a holiday. What, what's the difference? <laughs> he's trying, to, like, he's trying it, to knock him for being British. It's like a holiday. Uh, you, you quote the Dow. Like you mock the holiday. Are you going to start like doing they actually, accent? No, he actually goes on vacation, unlike an idiot like me, who's glued to my phone the whole time. Going, oh, OMG, time. look at Japanese. <laughs> yeah, on radio. pass me a punch. Okay. Tom is having, <clears throat> you know, a, a moment. <laughs> uh, futures deteriorate, negative 59 uh, right now. What happens is you try to get somebody quick when there's sudden moves and they can't attend. Mark McCormick yesterday was in line for Toronto Maple Leaf season uh, tickets. He does that with Toronto Dominion Bank up in Toronto. He joins us now, global head of FX strategy after begging for him to come on uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mark, explain to our American listeners and viewers why they should pay attention to the institutions of Japan and their experiment with modern monetary theory. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I guess a uh, vacation is when you don't log into your Bloomberg for a week. But um, in Never the context it. of <clears throat> yeah, same here, in the context of the end, it's it's quite interesting because again we're back to we know the BOJ what they're trying to achieve psychologically. It seems like they want to earn more credibility on inflation, uh, get five year five year inflation expectations higher, tr maybe potentially try to push wages a little bit higher, and even get past the uh, the July uh, upper house election. But I think what's interesting is we are now kind of focused on what are the internal drivers of what's happening in Japan and the external drivers, which really relates back to oil, terms of trade, and rates. Uh, so I think what we're seeing here is the market's really worried about recession fears, 50% uh, chance priced in, in across right. U.S. and other countries. So if rates are starting to turn over, real rates are capped, and oil prices are down almost over 10% from the peak, the question around the yen is our models that kind of track these things are telling us dollar yen should be around 130 but, you know, the, what's going to push dollar yen a little bit higher in the short run is the market still has to kind of push away from what the BOJ has done, which is continuing to try to weaken the yen. So we're we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place where there's just a lot more volatility, yeah. more uncertainty. But it feels like fading dollar yen is still kind of a decent trade in the very short run. I, and tangential to that down the Pacific Rim, Mark, all of a sudden I got something like dollar Thai bot, weaker Thai bot. Almost log convex, which means there's an acceleration to the weakness, and I got a 10% depreciation from February. Does that matter for Chairman Powell today in the crucible of the capital? Well, I think what matters for Powell is is really again the, the the context around the international inflation environment. So I think what they're you know he talked about a lot, and I think everyone's focused on the market is the month over month inflation print. Like that is the barometer. Every client that we talk to that's really trying to think beyond inflation in an asset right. allocation framework that's beyond inflation is like. What does the next month over month print do? And I think, again, a big driver of this is really commodities. So if like oil has started to, in you know, week over week and month over month terms, people are feeling a little bit more confident that maybe they can put on non-inflationary based trades and try right. to hope that we're in the peak inflation environment. I mean, at least it's never going to come up today. But I'm sorry, the international study that Mark McCormick does is germane to what Powell will say. And Bill Dudley actually pointed to this as the potential pain point, the idea of an emerging market issue or some sort of mass disruption as the dollar continues to strengthen. Mark, do you see that as something that is plausible, if not likely? Well, I think what's interesting is there's a, a and we talked about it in our note, is that it's like there's a lot of different structures around the world. The number one question we're getting is like, when does the dollar peak and when do we see RV trades come back again? And that's where we were even in the first half of the year. So within EM, it's about fragmentation. There's countries that look like they have 
what I would call reflation, where there's decent growth but still high inflation. There's countries where you have stagflation, which is weak growth and high inflation. And there's actually countries all throughout Asia where growth is slowing and inflation is slowing. And that's China. So what you're getting is policy divergence. Asia is still basically trying to boost the credit cycle. They're easing financial conditions versus the U.S. tightening financial conditions. So you can get a weaker remedy. But a lot of people are saying, well, where can I invest? I want to buy where financial conditions are easing. So people are talking a lot about moving into Asian equities. And therefore, you do have limitations on how much these currencies can weaken. So you do what you get is emerging markets. It kind of depends on which country. Like SEMA is very challenged, obviously, because it's just a satellite connected to, to Russia. But I think there's people are focusing on I can see a weaker renminbi. I could see maybe a stronger Korean won. I could see a stronger Aussie dollar, largely because China is stimulating while the U.S. is, uh, is being priced higher for a recession. So I think the divergence trades are actually becoming quite interesting again, where emerging markets um, are kind of unpacked into different regional prospects rather than just thinking the whole group of whether they underperform versus the U.S. dollar. Mark, I realize the answer to this question may differ depending on what currency you are talking about, but where is the line between where tighter policy is helpful to a currency and hurtful? Yeah, I think it depends on uh, the context that we're in right now. So if we're talking about high inflation and weak growth, uh, what's really critical is is trying to maintain policy credibility. You see it in LATAM. Uh, if you kind of look at like which currency baskets have outperformed the most this year, mm -hmm. LATAM is still positive. Um, largely, again, because you've got higher terms of trade, you've got higher oil prices, you've got central banks have been very aggressive and active. And again, the conversation is, is even around peaking inflation, there's conversations of like whether or not you start receiving rates in Mexico and Brazil, which is not right. exactly the, the type of trade you would have. So I think the line mm. here is who has established the most credibility around inflation. And while we're pricing in recession risks, you know, which countries still have the ability to stimulate uh, on right. the growth side? And this is where Europe is becoming quite interesting. We are still getting fiscal stimulus coming from the eurozone. And if they can actually pull together something that alleviates the fragmentation between bonds and BTBs, then you have a credible policy, uh, even though mm -hmm. the market doesn't really like the euro. You've mm -hmm. got something that's starting to come together that could really anchor right. the euro in the next six months. Mark McCormick, thank you so much. You're out of time. Global head of FX strategy, TD Securities. Uh, Lisa, I missed this headline. It was about 40 minutes ago. This is Putin of Russia, and he's channeling Jim O'Neill. BRICS are working on a basket-based reserve currency. I think that's Brazil. Russia, India, China. I think those are the bricks, Lisa. The bigger, the, the bigger issue to me is how do they get away from the weaponization of the U.S. dollar in the same kind of way? And can Russia get some support in that for a reserve currency yeah. that could compete? It's about as likely, the brick reserve currency is probably about as likely as Manchester United winning. So You're going to get some hate mail. I'd put it. You're going to get some serious hate mail. Next, Abby Joseph Cohen. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Futures negative 60, a little bit of a deterioration. Kaylee Lines in for Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and we're here uh, to really address Chairman Powell today. We'll have some discussion of that in a moment. But right now, Professor Abby Joseph Cohen joins us. She is entrenched at the Columbia Business School and, of course, for decades at Goldman Sachs is, is a partner. Uh, Professor, how's it going? What a shift to go from the 25-hour week of Goldman Sachs down to the cushy job as a professor at one of our acclaimed schools. How abrupt has the shift been? Well, it was 25 hours a day, not a week. Um, Excuse me. Um, correct. That, that, that's, that's quite all right. Um, it has been a wonderful uh, adjustment right. for me, frankly. You know, I was an adjunct at Columbia for almost a decade, so I knew what I was getting into. Um, I love the students at Columbia. Half of them are from overseas, and it's a terrific right. faculty. Um, you and I'm spending, I'm spending time with a lot of the faculty uh, working on new curriculum uh, materials right. for them, incorporating the real world aspects uh, into the academic work. And the foundation here, folks, is something that's a rite of passage if you're in the racket. 
you must read either 1934 Graham Dodd, or maybe you catch up with Graham Dodd and Cottle. Right now, we look at Graham Dodd and Joseph Cohen, which is going to be the new definitive book out of Columbia Business School. How do you take the fundamentals that we were weaned on and drag them forward into Jerome Powell's modern age? Tom, that is a wonderful question, but first let me set the stage. And that is to say, for the last few years, the fundamentals have mattered less than things like momentum uh, and investor enthusiasm. Now, you take a look, for example, at the strong correlation between the technology stocks, cryptocurrency, and so on, and basically say these are types of financial assets um, in which valuation approaches really didn't matter very much. And I think we're now back Uh, into a period in which it does matter, where it's the fundamentals of earnings, the fundamentals of margins, the fundamentals of inflation and interest rates, and putting that all together in terms of appropriate valuation models, that will make a big difference for investors going forward. Abby, how do you model the fundamentals at a time when people can't game out whether we're going to have a sanguine economy or a hard landing that looks something like a depression? At what point do you game out recessionary outcomes in your fundamental analysis? Yeah, you know, there are two different ways um, to look at that, Lisa. First of all, we can game out alternative scenarios. So we have some sense of what the range of possibilities might be, not just for equities, but other financial assets. But of course, at the end of the day, an investor or portfolio manager has to say, what do I think is the most likely scenario? You can always plan for the worst if you have very little risk tolerance. You can always plan for the best uh, if you're highly risk averse. But I think many portfolio managers are aiming for something in the middle where they're trying to identify what is the most likely scenario. Right. And as some of your earlier guests indicated, what seems to be priced in right now is a mild recession, uh, certainly not a severe recession. When you look at the parameters, do you look at the end of the era of free money or do you look at uh, just simply a pause, a a momentary reprieve from the ultra low rates of more than a decade as we try to curtail inflation and then a reversion back to that at the end? Yeah, let me adjust the question just a little bit, Lisa, and to say that money isn't free anymore, but in many cases it's not particularly expensive, particularly by historical standards. And so while we have seen this rise in interest rates and the Fed is likely to continue to move those short rates higher, we've already seen quite an increase in the intermediates and the longs and the rates that affect consumers, for example, through mortgages. Uh, And so what we have to recognize is that when money becomes more expensive, in some ways, investors, households, become much more careful with it. Um, Because if it's no longer free, um, you're going to see less leverage, which is a good thing. Uh, In portfolios, for example, we've had incredible returns in some private equity portfolios. Maybe the basic returns were good, but in some cases they've been turbocharged by significant amounts of leverage, which sort of hide the underlying a skill set, if you will, of, of a portfolio manager. And then, of course, there are many corporations that took advantage of very inexpensive money to leverage up their results. Um, and so when money is no longer free, we get to see a better picture of whether those corporate managers and those portfolio managers are actually doing a good job. Well, Abby, you talk about how people are more careful with their money in this kind of environment. And we know that it wasn't just, you know, corporations and big port institutional investors that were moving money around during the pandemic free money area. You also had stimulus that was fueling the the retail investor and they have been a force within these markets. What happens when that goes away? Uh, What we are looking at, of course, is a situation in which individuals in many cases became overly enthusiastic about some areas of the market, equities and elsewhere, including digital currencies that offered good momentum. Um, And what we are moving into and have already begun uh, to see is what happens when the momentum breaks down and you need to start looking at the valuations per se. Now, Individual investors, of course, have many different factors that they need to be concerned about. Uh, Some of it has to do with 
how much longer they have in their investment horizon, what else they might need uh, the capital for, and and so on. Right. And so we, in fact, see less money, and we have already seen this, going into things like cap-weighted ETFs. Mm. We've not yet seen right. the intermediate aspect, and, and I don't think it's going to be all that bad, yeah, quite I mean, frankly. I- Just looking at the demographic. I say this in great honor of your 2005 paper, which is definitive, folks. It's basically codified within the CFA Institute, Aristotle on Investment Decision Making. We have dragged ourselves, Professor, from the elegance of 2005 to a 2022 discussion of what's called a cathartic puke. How does catharsis play into fundamental analysis and the confidence to own equities? Do I need to go down substantially to find a base to own equities? We are now, I believe, Tom, in a situation where beta will be less important than alpha. Uh, and that Explain is- Explain that, please. That's, that's really important. Explain that. Investors always think that they are smart in a bull market, right? So if you're invested in a bull market, almost anywhere in a bull market, the beta of of the market, and that has to do just with slopes of of, of lines and so on. Um, Don't confuse um, uh, basically a bull market for genius. And and so that's beta. Alpha is security selection. Um, And one of the curious things about the last two to three years in particular is that there's, it's been really hard to get alpha. Um, So investors, professionals who've used sophisticated approaches, try to identify what particular securities they wanted to invest in, often stumbled uh, because alpha didn't matter very much. With this dramatic reset in the markets, the overall decline, number one, number two, the breakdown of the momentum orientation, and number three, the recognition that the economic cycle itself is shifting we see a move now, I believe, toward alpha. And that's not just within the US equity market, it's likely to happen in other developed markets as well. And also think of it more broadly in terms of asset categories that are no longer all going to be moving in lockstep. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go, Abby, and we just have about a minute left. Does this mean that it's the end of the sort of standard 60-40 in terms of just working and needing a more nuanced scalpel approach, even with asset allocation? Let's recognize that that 30 year plus period in which inflation and interest rates were under good control and continue to move lower is over. That doesn't mean that a year or two from now, inflation will be under incredible uncontrol uh, and interest rates still dramatically rising. I don't expect that, but we are exiting that 30 year period in which fixed income securities were a very good place to be invested. And that 40% rule right now may not be uh, you know, such a clever thing. One other point, if I may, that Aristotle paper talks about the importance of understanding the data. Let me give you one example right now. There's so much focus on headline CPI. CPI. You guys have gone, done a great job of contrasting headline CPI to core CPI What the Fed is looking at is the better measure, which is core PCE, which is running three to four percentage points below the headline CPI. So rather than looking at like an 8% number, they're looking at a number which is 5% and maybe Mm -hmm. a little bit lower. It's still a rise in inflation. I don't mean to suggest not, but it is not right. quite as awful looking as the headlines would suggest. Abby Joseph Cohen, thank you so much for joining Bloomberg and Bloomberg Surveillance uh, today at Columbia Business School. Lisa, I think this is the arch debate, and I don't know if Chairman Powell will go mathy on the Senate uh, today, but the idea of the gloom of 9 8%, whatever it is, and OMG, when do we get back to 2%? Versus, is, is Professor Joseph Cohen mentions there, the marginal move. Take core, 6.x% and you come down a little, then you come down a little, 
and you come down a little, how does that change perception? Yeah, and how does that factor into active investing <clears throat> and the potential return uh, therein? Yeah. We're going to be talking about that as well as the contours of a recession, what it means and what's priced in. With Tony Despirito coming up on the open, he's chief investment officer for BlackRock, right. uh, U.S. Fundamental Equity uh, Portfolio Management. This, to me, is really ultimately the question, Tom. Are we looking right now at a recession right. that might not be so bad or has already been yeah. priced in? Do you see how I got Abby Joseph Cohen to say cathartic puke? I, I failed, but I tried, Lisa. Good job. Good yeah, job. I tried. Get a blue ribbon. That, that was that very, very interesting there. Read Graham Dodd and Cottle. That's all I got to say. It's a rite of passage. Futures deteriorate, negative 50, now negative 62 on the Standard & Poor's. John Farrow Futures. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. Bloomberg's learned that President Biden will call on Congress to enact a gasoline tax holiday. The president's expected to make a statement today. Average gasoline prices are around $5 a gallon in the U.S. and they typically rise in summer. Federal taxes at 18.4 cents a gallon. It's not clear how long the president wants the tax to be paused. In Afghanistan, at least 920 people have been killed and hundreds more injured in a powerful earthquake. The magnitude 6.1 quake struck the southeastern part of the country overnight. The government has sent helicopters and rescue teams. There's a sign that China's broad crackdown on tech companies such as Ant Group may be easing. President Xi Jinping chaired a meeting today that approved promoting what was called the healthy development of the payment and fintech sector. Beijing has promised to unwind crackdowns that torpedoed Ant's record initial public offering in 2020. The American affiliate of the largest global crypto exchange, Binance, will offer zero free trading for Bitcoins. Binance US also plans to eliminate the charges for more tokens in the future. That will put pressure on other crypto exchanges like Coinbase to lower their fees. Rents on a million apartments in New York City will go up by the most in nearly a decade. A panel approved a 3.25% raise for one-year leases and 5% for two years. That reflects the political promises of Mayor Eric Adams. He's a landlord himself who has signaled strong support for small businesses and property owners. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I think it's going to be a relatively mild recession at this point because uh, the Fed, the, the financial system looks like it's pretty solid. Household and business balance sheets look like they're pretty solid. You really get a deep downturn when things in the financial system break and the ability to supply credit to people becomes impaired. I don't expect that to happen this time. Bill Dudley, the former president of the New York Fed, senior advisor for Bloomberg Economics, with a blistering note today on hard landing. It is a required read for Global Wall Street. Lisa put it out on Twitter. I retweeted her retweet of the retweet, and uh, it's out there somewhere. Kaylee Lines and Tom King. Kaylee in for John Farrow uh, as well. Lisa preparing for the 9 o'clock Farrow property, as they do. Kriti Gupta is here to distill a chart on distillates. Kriti, what do you have? Yeah, we got to talk about gasoline here, Tom, because we're talking about just how high prices and are. And Jerome in Powell will talk about it. Of course, he yeah. will in his testimony today. And this is something of really becoming a global global issue. So for my chart of the day, we don't go to the U.S. gasoline issue. We go to the European gasoline issue where inflation is higher. And of course, the cost of living crisis is far worse than where it is here in the States. I'm showing you folks a, a chart of margins here, the gasoline margins relative to Brent crude. And it goes back all the way to 2005 for our radio audience. Really what you need to know is from 2005 to about 2019, it's almost a straight line when you look at the regression, which tells you that there isn't a ton of movement in those refining margins. But then 2020, 2020, a sharp acceleration, really speaking to that need for that refining capacity, that really record demand that you're seeing. And it's a topic that President Biden has mentioned multiple times as well as soon or as recently as yesterday, of course, in response to that pretty scathing letter from the Chevron CEO, Mike Worth, Tom. Critty, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. We prepare now for Chairman Powell coming up here with headlines, I believe, at 930 and then on to his testimony after opening statements. You'll hear that and see that. 
on Bloomberg. We're thrilled to do that for you this morning. But we need a brief, and we need it from where the televisions and radio will be tuned in, and that is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Anne-Marie Horton joining us now, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Anne-Marie, what does President Biden need this morning from Jerome Powell? I think really what you're going to want to see from Jerome Powell is how he's received up on the hill, right? Like, what's the tone of his reception? Is it going to be very harsh? I mean, you're not going to get a standing ovation. But at the same time, is there going to be some reception that these senators like what the Fed is doing in terms of really wanting to tamp down inflation and becoming much more hawkish on it? Obviously, the questions are going to be about inflation and then while you're trying to control inflation, how much of a risk does Chair Powell see when it comes to this narrow, really, scope of not going into a U.S. recession? I mean, the panics over recession, Abby Joseph Cohen just joining us from Columbia Business School, Amory making clear this panic is unfounded. We need to look at fundamentals. The fundamental for Chairman Powell and, quite frankly, for President Biden is core inflation. Right. There's glimmers of hope, right? Glimmers of hope when it comes to core inflation. But at the Fed meeting, what did uh, Mike McKee, our very own mm-hmm. colleague, I think he asked the best question, which is, are you going to chase headline inflation, a.k.a. are you going to trace chase higher oil prices? And Chair Powell said our mandate is inflation. That's headline inflation. He made pretty clear that Americans do not like high inflation. It's obvious. And you see that every day in things that are part of the headline number, which is gasoline prices. Right, and that's why it's so political, because the most obvious to the American consumer sign of inflation is when you see that price ticker at your gas station ticking higher and higher and higher. When do the politics of inflation, the problematic politics of inflation for the Democratic uh, Party, turn into politics of unemployment and potentially higher unemployment as a result of the Fed's action to tame inflation? Well, I think that's something they're struggling with, but they have made clear that they understand that growth is going to be slower. And part of hiking rates and tamping down inflation is going to mean, and we saw this in the Fed forecast, slower growth and higher unemployment. That seems that at this moment, this is something that this administration and the Fed is clearly willing to swallow because they've made it clear that inflation is the number one issue. Yeah, Marie, we're trying to get visceral with all of our guests about inflation, the true story of inflation. And with you, and I've got to go to Jay Powell in the September 21 meeting, which will be after he gets a can of tomatoes from the Hordern family (laughs) after your August canning of tomatoes. The price of tomatoes, I just did a study, it's up 55%. I mean, oh, it's, it's, it's everywhere, Amory. I mean, whether you're canning tomatoes with Amory Horton or not, inflation is everywhere for Jay Powell. It's everywhere. It's groceries, gasoline, rent. These are the huge problems. And especially when it comes to groceries, part of this obviously exacerbated by what we're seeing with Russia's <clears throat> invasion of Ukraine when it comes to crops. That's going to show up, especially in the most mournable vulnerable developed parts of the world, places like Egypt that have to have in massive imports. But then at the same time, America is a farm to truck to table economy. We get our groceries through trucks, higher diesel prices, which is why the president today is going to call for a gas tax holiday on gasoline as well as diesel, because that is critical to the U.S. consumer. And to your good point, I make light of it, but this is no joke, folks. It's about the process of hydrocarbons within our agricultural system. Anne-Marie Hordern, thank you so much. And Kaylee Lines, and I really look for the invite here to the Hordern (laughs) canning of tomatoes in August. Kaylee, can you imagine that? The kitchen must be destroyed. I just hope I get a can of it, Tom. Well, that's How do we know when the the can rationing comes? I don't know. Is there like a list we sign up on? You know, it's 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 we we get food gifts from time to time. Maybe we'll get something from Anne Marie Horton as well. This testimony is not normal. We have to remember, and the headlines came out. I just saw a headline. I do not have it in front of me of new Canadian inflation back to 1983. Mm. Kaylee, I mean, it's hitting every country everywhere. Yeah, it absolutely is, Tom. It's hitting consumers across the board as they grapple with higher <clears throat> costs for right. necessities, raising a question of how long they're going to continue to spend on discretionary right. items. And of course, as the market grapples with inflation, and not just that, but the response mechanism of central banks to it, you are starting to see some real pressure in this market, yeah. Tom. Equities back lower. And I'm looking at the 10-year yield right now. 
down 11 basis points. Yeah, I'm serious. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you bring that up to four digits down 12 basis points, 3.16%. Uh, Matt from Ducati emails in and says, Tom, no crypto chat today. What <laughs> happened? What should we look for seriously, Kaylee, in crypto as we touched 19,000 earlier? Yeah, we got a little taste below 20,000 once again. Tom, crypto <clears throat> right now is just so entirely coordinate, coordinated with broader risk sentiment. The correlation so? is very clear. On a day when equities are down, reversal like today, you are seeing crypto giving it back. It's very hard after all of the conversation talking about it as a potential inflation hedge or non-correlated asset. That is not how right. it's been performing as yeah. of late. Here's where we're setting up for Global Wall Street this morning with futures at negative 58. A bit of a deterioration in the last hour. The VIX out of stick now, 30 31.23 on the VIX. As Kaylee Lines mentions, 3.16% on the 10-year gets your attention in a big 12 basis points. To see the two-year break 3%, would be a huge deal. We're not there. 3.09% on the two-year yield. We draw your attention to the testimony of the chairman of the Federal Reserve System, the monetary report to the nation. We will bring complete coverage of that on radio and television. And look for the headlines here in about 35 minutes. Again, futures at negative 58. Dollar resilient this morning. And the yen that we're watching, uh, the yen 135.85. This is Bloomberg.